All right, so here we are again. Um, I think this ought to be a pretty quick lecture because the topic is deflate, a compression scheme from 1993, which is 30 years ago. And I don't think anything that's 30 years old can really be that complicated, right? So I figure we can get this done in half an hour and I can take an early lunch. So why don't we get started? Uh, we want to talk about the deflate format, but deflate is a bitstream. Uh, and if we actually want to use deflate in some context, for example, to compress files, we have to embed that bitstream in some container. And there are a few options for how we can do this. It turns out that we'll actually come back later and see a few other containers that use uh, that are used to contain deflate bitstreams. Um, deflate was originally released in 1993 as part of this package, a pkzip. So pkzip was a file compression tool that originated the .zip format. Um, and originally it used other compression methods, so including LZW. But as I mentioned in earlier lectures, um, LZW suddenly fell out of favor because of patent enforcement. And generally speaking, people would rather not be sued. And so there was a rise of new attempts at compression schemes when people started enforcing those patents on LZW. And so among other programs, PKZIP was affected. And in version two of PKZIP, a brand new compression scheme based on LZSS and LZ77 and Huffman coding was brought in called Deflate. Um, and so the inventor of Deflate, as far as I can tell, is the person behind PKZIP. So PK actually stands for the inventor's initials, Phil Katz. Uh, so really, if we wanted to cover Deflate from the point of view of, the, of its original invention, we could talk about zip files. The thing is that the zip format is designed for archival. So of course it does use compression, but not just compression. It's also designed to store a whole bunch of files, preserving their directory structure uh, with a few other features. And in particular, um, inside of a .zip archive, there could be a whole bunch of different deflate bitstreams, one for each file. Uh, so instead, and maybe also reflecting a certain bias that I have working in a, in a Linux or Unix ecosystem for so long, I'm going to cover deflate from the point of view of the gzip uh, format or the .gz container used by the gzip program. Uh, and that you're going to do the same on assignment two. So you're going to, um, on assignment two, write a program that produces a compressed bitstream that can be decompressed by the gzip decompressor. Now, unlike on assignment one, the bitstream you produce might look very little like what the gzip compressor produces, because what we're going to see, a theme of this lecture, is that the writer of a deflate compressor has tons and tons of options. The compressor can make tons of different choices, and so two different fully compliant compressors for deflate bitstreams or the gzip format can produce completely different output. Um, and one set of output could be different, or they could be the same size, but still the bitstreams could be completely different. Um, and so this lecture, I guess we're going to peel the onion from the outside. Um, in this lecture, we're going to start by talking about the container format, uh, which is gzip, and then work our way down into the deflate bitstream and go deeper and deeper into the details of the deflate bitstream. Um, so this is going to use the .gz format because we need some container. So we're not going to cover the .gzip format too thoroughly, just enough that we can generate um, something that's compliant uh, that we can decompress using the gzip decompressor. So .gz itself is a container format, at least in theory, so the best intentions of the designers being kept in mind, um, the .gz format was designed uh, to be able to hold compressed data in a variety of different formats. And in fact, uh, notwithstanding what I just said about how we'd rather not cover an archival format like .zip, it turns out that .gz was originally designed to be able to store multiple files. Um, of course, if you use .gz uh, files these days, if you ever want to create an archive compressed with gzip, you probably first feed uh, your files into the tar format. So you use the tar uh, utility to create a tar archive, um, and then you take that archive and compress the whole thing with gzip. Uh, and so that's an example of how the container format was designed with one intention, but it turns out that gzip was just really good at, at creating deflate bitstreams, and nobody ever really picked up on the other uh, apparent features of that format. So in practice these days, if somebody's going to use gzip, they're probably going to use it to compress just one file at a time. And again, if you wanted to create an archive of a bunch of different files, what you would probably do on a Linux or Unix machine is first create a tar file and then feed that tar file into the gzip compressor to create the venerable .tar.gz format that I'm sure you've already seen. 
One of the reasons this is a good idea is that tar is really good at creating archives. It's not good at compression, at least in and of itself. When you uh, use the tar command on the command line, you can ask it to, to call out to a compression program for you. But in general, the tar format isn't really that good at compression. Its job is creating archives. And in the classic Unix uh, philosophy of do one thing and do it well, it's probably better to trust the, the tar utility to make archives for me and trust gzip just to do the compression. Because the archival features built into the .gz format aren't really as comprehensive as we might want. So typically when you create archives of files, you want to preserve everything about the underlying file system. You may not need all of it, but you want it all to be there. You want things like the user that created the file, uh, the group uh, that owns the file, uh, when the file was created, when the file was last modified, the read and write permissions on the file, all of that stuff, you want that to be saved. And tar is really good at making sure all of that gets saved. Tar even has built-in options to handle things like what happens when you compress symbol links, stuff like that. So of course, it's good to trust the tar format for archival and the .gz format just to compress one file. The archival features built into the gzip format are a little bit underwhelming, which is one reason they never really get used anymore. Um, it's also true that the gzip format actually supports multiple compression types. I'll come back to this in a few minutes. Um, it was apparently designed, so .gz, um, gzip and the .gz format were designed a few years after pkzip volume 2 came out. The, the documentation comes came out in 1996. Uh, so I would say that means it's reasonably likely that gzip and .gz were created sometime between 1993 and 1996. Um, and maybe the idea was to create a sort of open source zip file-like um, compression tool that used deflate. Uh, and so I suppose in that case, maybe it should support multiple compression formats, just like the .zip format does. Uh, and so the designers of gzip very clearly wanted to support multiple compression formats. But one way or the other, uh, it turns out that if you try and use any other compression format, uh, the encoder won't do it and the decompressor will reject it. So even though there is a way of selecting compression formats in the file format, if you ever try to select a format other than deflate, um, the decompressor will not allow you to use it. So one, whatever, the designers had good intentions, nobody really cared, we just used gzip as a vehicle for deflate. Uh, and so uh, the deflate bitstream is actually distinct from the gzip container. The gzip uh, format was designed to be a relatively general container that you could insert any compressed bitstream into. At least in theory, I suppose, um, maybe they were thinking you might want to later embed some LZW bitstream like the ancient Unix compress tool does. Uh, that never came to fruition. Uh, so uh, the deflate bitstream is actually distinct from the container. Uh, in terms of this hex dump, not that it makes much of a difference now, but it turns out in this hex dump, the first 10 bytes are specific to the .gz container. That would be the header. So that is a bit of information that tells any program reading this encoded file um, that it is a gzip format file and a few other bits of information, including what compression format was used and so on. Um, at the very end, the last eight bytes, this is a footer. This is also part of the um, .gz format. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Everything in the middle, so beginning at this um, 0x73 and ending down here at this 0x00, all of these bytes here, these are not specific to the gzip container. This is the deflate bitstream. And of course, our goal of this lecture is to cover that. We just can't cover it until we know how, where to put it, until we know what file format we can use such that we can check our work. Uh, okay, so here is a basic uh, breakdown of the gzip format as far as we're concerned. Now, the .gz format is standardized. It is officially documented in a document called RFC 1952. And just in case anybody reading this is familiar with internet standards, you might look at that word archaic and wonder whether I have current information. Archaic? Well, so it turns out that the RFC series of documents dates back to 1969. However, it's still active today. So there are still RFCs being written even in 2023, as far as I can tell. It is not obsolete. It isn't even really arcane. I think that the word archaic is still fitting because compared to what you probably expect when you hear the words standard standards document, the RFC series is quite a bit less formal, um, and it's specified in a way that does look maybe a little bit dated, or I guess dated isn't quite the, quite the right word, but it certainly has a certain early internet flavor to it. And I think a very brief digression, this is a quick lecture anyway, so a brief digression for a history lesson I think is warranted. So the internet as we currently know it, I guess coalesced in the early 1990s. 
It's really hard to put a date on it because the internet, as we now think of it, when we talk about internet access, we're talking about something that never really had a, a day zero. It, it emerged out of other computer networks that existed beforehand. But certainly, I think nobody argues that one of the major predecessors of the internet was something called ARPANET, which arose out of a US government project in the 1960s. And over time, ARPANET grew to be a connection of different large institutions across the United States. These institutions would be a mixture of government institutions, so government agencies, uh, military agencies, as well as universities, large private companies, maybe defense contractors, which are also private companies. So you, you can, that's a political thing. You can look that up. Um, and so this basically a computer network of essentially point to point links between these institutions. And so if you were a student or a faculty member at a large university back then, maybe you had some mainframe in the basement of some building on campus that was connected to the ARPANET. And how exactly that connectivity worked is complicated. Maybe that's outside the scope of this history lesson. Um, but the idea was, uh, this was, the, I, I guess, where the idea of email originated. So the, you could send messages to colleagues at other institutions. Those messages could contain data that you could, you could provide them source code. You could provide them some kind of encoding of binary data. And you can think, if you're a researcher at one of these institutions, you might have some clever idea for ways to synchronize information between points or make the network protocols more efficient. So what would you do? Well, what you'd probably do, if you were sitting at one of these nodes of the network, if you were at a university somewhere, if you had an idea for some new network protocol, and oh, I don't know, how about network protocols like TCP or IP or UDP, all of which it turns out were originally standardized using RFC documents. If you had an idea for some clever new um, network protocol or something relevant to this project of ARPANET, this network, what you'd probably do is you'd type up a memo and it would be a memo, so it would still be relatively informal. It would be technically specific, but not absolutely, I guess, at a, le a tedious level of detail. You type up one of these memos, and maybe you'd photocopy it and, and you know, walk it down the hall to your colleagues. But maybe you would send it out as an electronic message to everybody on the ARPANET um, for, to, for colleagues at different institutions to take a look at and provide feedback. What you might do is write it up and send it out with a request for comments. And so this RFC series of internet standards documents began as just a way for people that came up with clever new tricks, clever new network protocols or whatever, to elicit feedback on their proposals, requests for comment. But over time, I guess, it became the case that if you wanted to have your document enrolled in the formal archive of RFC documents, probably by the time you finished writing it, it was already uh, pretty standardized. You already had a bit of feedback. You already had a pretty good idea of what you were doing. And so over time, these requests for comments turned into standards documents. And so by the time that these standards for GZIP and Deflate were published, that would be RFC 1951 and 1952, which were published in 1996, which was 26 years after RFCs first came into being, by the time that we reached 1996, RFCs were considered, once an RFC was published, it was a standards document. It described something that already was pretty fully formed. Okay, whatever. So because of the long history, RFCs themselves are still plain, or until relatively recently, as of 1996, RFCs RFCs were still plain text files, um, so they weren't formatted very well, and they were worded relatively informally, which means that there were some details that the reader would have to interpolate from the context. A lot of other standards documents these days wouldn't do that. Instead, as we'll see later with standards like the JPEG standard, which I find to be a pretty boring read, JPEG actually predates deflate, um, with other standards documents, often the document itself is specified to such a tedious level of detail that it's really difficult to get through it in one sitting or any number of sittings, frankly, because of how boring it is. Um, and that can be beneficial because as those of you that have taken courses in requirements engineering probably know, um, it's nice to have a, spe have a specification that is precise. Uh, it's nice to have all the details laid out, even if it's it's a boring read because it does make sure that somebody later, even a hundred years later, can still implement the same thing. Okay, whatever. So that's my justification of my word archaic. I stand by it. If you still disagree, come and argue with me in the office hours. So the structure of a gzip file, keeping in mind that there are going to be some features that we don't really need, um, the structure of a gzip, gzip file broadly is going to consist of these three pieces. Formally though, a .gz file consists of one or more members 
And the idea is a member is basically one compressed file. So remember that originally .gz was a format designed to allow you to batch together multiple files into one .gz archive, because it was designed with some very basic archival features. As I mentioned, though, those archival features weren't comprehensive, and so it does make sense that people would rather use tar than uh, the gzip uh, format itself for archival. So each member in a .gz file contains three pieces, a header, some compressed data of some kind, which we'll see has to be deflate, followed by a footer. Um, a .gz archive can contain this sequence, header, compressed stuff, footer, more than once, because there could be more than one member. Um, but in practice, as I said, uh, generally nobody does that anymore. Generally, there's only going to be one member present, and we're going to follow that convention. So for assignment two, your .gz file should, okay, nope, not should. We've got to use standards quality language here, so I should say must or will or shall. So for assignment two, your .gz output shall, will, or must, you can choose your favorite, contain only one member. So each of the elements here, the header, the footer, and the stuff in between should uh, appear only once. Now, of course, inside the stuff sandwiched in the middle, the compressed blocks, there could be a large number of blocks of data. That isn't really an issue with the gzip format, because the format of what goes in here, that's up to the bitstream, the deflate bitstream, the specific choice of compression scheme. In any event, for our purposes on assignment two, the beginning of your .gz file will be the header, which will appear only once, and the end of your .gz file will be the footer, which will also appear only once. Uh, so every member starts with a header. As I said, there's only going to be one header in your output. Now, the header actually has some flexibility. So uh, it turns out there are these two bits of the header, which are strangely not consecutive. The flags byte and this other byte XFL, which stands for extra flags. Um, these two bytes contain bit flags that allow you to turn on optional features. Now, depending on what optional features you turn on, um, the header could actually get longer. But some of the optional features, uh, if you take a look at the RFC, some of the optional features are sort of ridiculous. They're features like adding arbitrary text, uncompressed text to the header, something that we don't care about at all. Um, so we're obviously trying to use the gzip format as a vehicle for deflate, so we're going to generate the smallest possible header. And in practice, it looks like the gzip encoder does the same thing. I think the gzip encoder gets the idea that its job is to compress things and not to create this bloated archive format, so it also ch tends to generate relatively minimal headers. Although I think our headers are probably, I mean, our headers certainly are as small as they possibly can be. I think the gzip encoder might generate slightly larger headers than we do at some, in, in some cases. But anyway, at minimum, the header must have these 10 bytes. Uh, and I want to stop for a moment because I've just talked a bit about bytes, which means we now have to have that talk about how exactly do we convert bits to bytes. Now, you'll recall from lecture four, this was a bit of a thing. So there could be differences of opinion for how we turn a stream of bits. So here's some bits. How we turn a stream of bits into actual parsable bytes, uh, because we need to agree on a convention for that. And there could be differences of opinion. So for example, if we look at the first eight bits in this stream that I've just created, how do I turn this into a byte? Do I turn it into a byte with this being the most significant bit or this being the most significant bit? Well, we've got to work that out. And even if um, the answer isn't what we want, we do have to put up with it because we all sort of have to work with a common format. So in both the .gz file and the deflate bitstream, we pack bits into bytes as follows. Um, if we have a sequence, let me regenerate my sequence of bits. So here's my sequence of bits. Okay, so it keeps going on. Um, if I, the very first bit that I push into the stream becomes the least significant bit of the corresponding byte. Maybe I'll, I'll create a full byte here. Okay, so I've just created a byte. This was the first bit I pushed in, this zero. The first bit that I push into the stream, so if I talk about push three bits into the stream or push five bits into the stream, the very first bit I push becomes the least significant bit of the corresponding byte. Um, and then uh, the as I keep going, so rule number two, as I keep going, um, the more significant bits, then this becomes bit one, this becomes bit two, and so on. Um, and when I finally get to the eighth bit, that will be the most significant bit of the byte. Um, and that means once I have eight bits being pushed, I have to output this byte. But notice that if we think of bytes in the typical left to right or right to left 
um, order that we think of them. So typically, when we write a byte out, if I write an 8-bit binary value uh, that corresponds to a number, I would normally uh, write out the least significant bit on the right. But notice that in this case, the most significant bit is on the right. So if I turn it into a byte in our usual understanding, I am, just like with the Unix Compress tool, flipping the order of the bits. I am reversing them. So this would actually become, once I'm done reversing, I'll draw it down here, this would become 1111100. In other words, it would be 0xf4. So keep that in mind. That is true of everything in gzip and the deflate bitstream as far as we are going to work with it. Now, this was annoying on assignment one, but you already did it, so you do know what logic you need. Um, and because you already did it to save you some time, the starter package for assignment two, which I will talk about in a greater detail in a few minutes, the starter package for assignment two contains some code to do this already. In other words, I have provided some functions like push bit um, or in the C++ version object oriented stuff that allows you to just call a function to push a bit into the stream and there is some code already to handle all of this stuff. Okay, so if I'm making some arbitrary bit stream, uh, keep in mind the first bit I push will pack the byte that it's going into from least significant bit to most significant bit in that order. Okay, that's one thing. There's a second thing we have to talk about. It, it is a big deal because it's something you will have to worry about a lot in your code. And I'm going to call it rule number one. And spoiler alert, there is no rule number two. There is just this rule, and it is really important. And the reason that it's so important is that I don't think that the RFC does a good enough job uh, of making it clear how universal this rule is. So when I was implementing my own um, gzip encoder, essentially the model solution for assignment two, I was doing it by essentially using the RFC, reading about deflate in books, and trying to reverse engineer the source code to gzip and other encoders for deflate, because there isn't really comprehensive step-by-step -step documentation to create it. I've learned in the last three years since cr initially creating this lecture about deflate that apparently there are people out there on the internet that are watching my video of this lecture for lack of any better documentation. Imagine how bad it must be if they're watching my lecture um, to, to see the documentation for this scheme uh, because so little documentation exists. Okay, whatever. So when I was implementing it, I found that although this was stated, what I'm about to talk about was stated in the RFC, it wasn't clear to me until I was done writing the code exactly how universal it is. It applies literally always. And the rule is, whenever you are pushing a number into the bitstream, doesn't matter how many bits it occupies. So if ever in this lecture I talk about, oh, this is the number two stored in two bits, or this is the number five stored in four bits. If ever I talk about a bit sequence that corresponds to a number in base two, then that will always be pushed from least significant bit to most significant bit into the bitstream. So to continue our example from a minute ago, suppose I'm, I've been working on my bitstream, I've added these bits to my bitstream. Um, let's add, let's do one more. Okay, so I now I'm three bits away from having a byte. Okay, um, and I've been pushing my bits in. We know that when this becomes a byte, this will be the least significant bit and this will be the most significant bit. But I don't have a byte yet, so what do I do? Well, suppose that I've reached a point in my encoding where I have to add, I have to push a number into my bit stream. And suppose the number is the number six. So it's in base 10. And we know that, uh, suppose that we're representing this number six in three bits. So we know that the bit encoding uh, in three bits of six is this. Okay, so this is the value six in base two. What rule number one is saying is if ever you need to push a number into the bitstream, um, you push the bits starting at the least significant bit and working your way to the most significant bit. In other words, when I push this number into the bitstream, what I'm going to push is first the zero, then the two ones in that order. Now, to follow through from what we just talked about on the previous slide, notice how we now have a full byte of bits. And I've pushed the bits into the bitstream. Now I have to first reverse the order of the bits. So now the, the, the um, byte becomes 1101, um, 0100. And then I can output this byte, which would be 0xd4. Okay, so notice how um, I fill in my bitstream from left to right where the left is the least significant bit. As I'm going, if I'm pushing bits into my stream and I encounter a time when I want to push a number into my stream, the number gets pushed least significant bit first uh, and then moving up to most significant bit. When I fill up a byte, I reverse the order of the bits in the byte according at least to the visualization I'm using because keep in mind that going left to right or right to left or whatever is a matter of personal taste. Uh, according to the ordering I'm using, Using, where my bitstream fills in from left to right, I have to reverse the order of those bits, and then uh, I can output the resulting byte. 
Now, one thing you might notice, which frankly isn't that relevant because you're given code to do um, the part that turns the stream into bytes, one thing you might observe is that actually the reversal sort of, the, the two reversals sort of cancel out. Because I go, I fill my bytes up from least significant to most significant left to right, and I push my numerical values least significant to most significant, in a sense, when I finally see the number six in the resulting bit stream, notice how this is zero x, oh, this is zero, uh, one, one, zero. So the three bits are 110, which is six in the usual uh, order that we expect, the most significant bit first. But maybe don't concern yourself too much with that. Instead, whenever I invoke rule number one in this lecture, what I mean is that you are going to push numerical values with the first bit pushed be the, being the least significant bit of the number. And that applies for all numerical values. It doesn't apply for literally all bit sequences. So any bit sequence that corresponds to a number, so again, if you find yourself having to push the number six, but let's say encode it into three bits, then you have to push it applying rule number one with the least significant bit first. On the other hand, if we discover later, for example, that a symbol like the letter A has a bit encoding, so 11010 or something, this is not a number. This is just a sequence of bits. So this is the encoding of a symbol using a prefix code. Rule number one doesn't apply to that. Rule number one always applies to numerical values, but not necessarily to other bit sequences. So an arbitrary sequence of bits just gets pushed from left to right. So you would call push bit on this bit first and then on this bit last. So you just push the bits into the stream from left to right and then let the stream logic, so that push bit function from the, the starter code, handle the rest. All right, fair enough. Now, it turns out the bit to byte conversion isn't as big of a deal in the header or footer of the gzip container because you'll notice everything in the header is byte aligned. But whatever, we still care because uh, when we push uh, the values in the header, it's still better to call push bit to do it. It's still generally better to follow all the rules. So the full details of each header are described in the RFC. So, I mean, the RFC is comprehensive, even if a bit informal. It's got some missing details, but you can figure them out eventually by context. Um, I'm only going to talk about what you need for the header for assignment two. So as I said, we can have longer headers or more complicated headers than this, but really the point of assignment two isn't gzip, it's deflate. So the first two bytes are going to be a magic number to identify the format. So a program looking at a file can try and figure out what format it's in or verify if it's the decompressor that indeed it is a gzip file by ensuring that the first byte is 0x1f and the second byte is 0x8b. Uh, so that's the magic number. The third byte, cm, is supposed to be the compression method. And the RFC uses peculiar language for this, but what it basically says is um, the compression method is one byte, so it's a, it's a number between 0 and 255. Um, the RFC says, well, compression methods numbered 0 through 7, those are reserved. And then compression method 8 is deflate. So um, of course that means for our purposes, in assignment two, you will always set CM to be eight, zero X zero eight. Um, I, I would observe that this appears to be the idea, like why do they give deflate they gave deflate the first number that they used, which is 8, and yet they reserved 0 through 7 for future use, and then you obviously never actually use them. I suspect this might be for compatibility with something. It could be that in, let's say, zip archives, um, deflate also was numbered higher, and so they wanted to maybe reserve the right to introduce other older formats with lower numbers. I don't know, whatever, we're stuck with this. As I mentioned earlier, this is a sign that gzip was designed to allow compression to a variety of compression schemes, but nobody ever used it for that. So the only compression scheme scheme you're actually allowed to use is deflate. So of course we're going to use that. There's a flags byte and it contains a bunch of bit flags. So each bit of this byte is a flag, zero or one, that turns on an optional feature. We do not want to turn on optional features. So one example of an optional feature is to insert the file name. So add a text field to your header with a file name. So uh, I don't know, my file dot txt, um, so that if you're using gzip as an archival format, you know the name of the file you have compressed. Um, we don't care, so we're not going to do that. There even is an option to add an arbitrary uncompressed text comment, which is peculiar. There are certainly ways somebody could use that to create clever gzip file based puzzles. So how do you create a gzip file with very little data in the compressed block section? We'll stick it all in a text comment. I don't know. Um, we don't need that, of course. So we're going to set flags to be zero. Disable all of the optional features. We just want to get to that compressed bitstream. Um, then there is M time, which contains the modification time of the compressed data. Uh, so 
really this is none of the, com the decompressor's business, whether I set this accurately. So the idea, I guess, is when you decompress the file, you want to, on the machine you're decompressing it, you want to say something like, well, let, let's set the modification time to match the modification time of the original input, or something like that. Um, I'm not going to worry about that so much, so in my opinion, we can set that to the actual time. So it is a four-byte value, a four-byte Unix timestamp, with the, that's a number, so rule number one applies. You could, if you wanted to, go get the current time, there are library functions that'll hand that to you pretty easily, and then set m time to that, or you can just set it to zero, which will set, which, as far as the decompressor is concerned, means the modification time was, I think, January 1st, 1970, which is amusing in some ways. Go ahead and do that, who cares? Because all we care about really is doing the compression. If you set this to any value you want, it shouldn't break the decompression process. Then there's XFL, the extra flags byte. And again, I have no idea why this wasn't just positioned right after the flags byte, but whatever. Uh, this is also to enable extra features. These are supposed to be extra, extra flags for the compression method. We're going to set this to 0, 0, 0 as well. We're going to leave all these, those flags turned off. And then finally, there is this one byte that's supposed to tell the decompressor the operating system that the compressor was running on. Um, it's meant to identify that. Now, it, the RFC contains this really hilarious table of operating systems, which is a great sort of time capsule into the mid-90s of what operating systems people thought might be used at the time. Um, it seems like uh, looking at the list, so here's the list, it seems like looking at this list, the reason that this was being used, the reason it was necessary to identify which OS was being used was mostly for file system reasons, not because we actually care what OS was being used, like what kernel is running, but because we care what file system was being used. And of course, back then, um, the choice of operating system pretty pretty much implied what file system you would be using, because once you've chosen an operating system, each OS had its own set of file systems it was likely to use. Let's just go through another history lesson we can throw in there. So OS identifier 0 is FAT. FAT stands for File Allocation Table. And those of you who just came out of CSC 360, some offerings of CSC 360 actually talk about this specific um, file system because it's simple enough to actually fit into a course uh, when you're covering file systems. Um, and maybe the reason this has number zero is because um, PKZIP, which originated the deflate format, um, was designed originally for DOS and, well, theoretically at least Windows machines, but PKZIP was a DOS program. It turns out that the designer of PKZIP, Phil Katz, apparently hated Windows, but you can run PKZIP uh, on Windows. Um, so I think maybe that, that put a, established a certain bias in favor of Windows coming first. I don't know, maybe I'm just bitter that Unix is, is fourth after Windows. Um, so then we've got Amiga. Okay, we haven't heard of Amiga in a long time. VMS, now you can look that up. It, I mean, it has a Wikipedia article. Um, there, hey, there's Unix. And of course, from today's point of view, pretty much every OS um, besides Windows today falls into the general bucket of Unix. So the machine on which I'm recording this, which is running Ubuntu, which is formerly Linux, or if you really want to be pedantic about it, GNU Linux, um, that would we would count that as a Unix derivative. Um, if you use a Mac, a relatively recent, let's say in the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or something, Mac, definitely you are also going to be using a Unix machine. Um, then there's VMCMS, okay, well, no, Atari, Atari, nope, HPFS, hey, it turns out that HP a uh, company that most people in these days probably know for making printers or something. Um, turns out they had a file system, but we're not going to worry about that. This, entry 7, is Mac, but it's the old Mac OS, so the classic Mac OS from before OS X, which nobody uses anymore. These two are related. This is an operating system. CPM is an operating system that slowly lost popularity as DOS and Windows gained popularity. So nope, I don't know what to I, even I don't know what TOPS 20 is. Um, there's NTFS. I suspect that modern Windows machines, if they wanted to choose something faithful to their file system, should choose NTFS, because NTFS, at least, the NTFS from the 90s is at least a precursor of the Windows file system that's typically used today on desktops. QDOS, nope. Acorn, Risk OS, no, we're not really big into Risk machines anymore. And then there's always 255 for unknown. So you can tell they just gave up making up new OS codes. Okay, that's the end of the history lesson. We are going to choose Unix because our reference platform is a Linux machine, which is Unix-ish. Um, and because frankly, these days, probably Unix is the best thing to choose. Uh, even on Windows machines, I wouldn't be surprised if gzip uses OS Identifier 3 for Unix. So we're gonna do that and you're required to do that. So we can argue all we want, but you're going to do that on assignment two. So that's the header. And again, the header could be longer, but we, we've set the header to be as short as possible. And then after the header is a sequence of one or more blocks encoded in deflate format. 
And by now we can, we can assume that it is a foregone conclusion that we are using deflate because we've set compression method to deflate. We've also learned that actually no other compression methods are supported. Um, now, one thing I should observe is from the point of view of gzip, so if you're the gzip container, you actually have no way of knowing um, that much about the structure of this. It's true, it's going to be one or more encoded blocks, but it's the deflate decoder that knows that. The gzip decoder for the container just knows that after the header is some compressed stuff. The compressed stuff is byte aligned, but you really know nothing about it. You have to leave it up to the specific decompression scheme, so deflate, to figure out how to parse the set of compressed blocks. After the, the decompressor for the deflate scheme is done, it turns control back over to the container format, which can then decompress the footer. Um, so I'll, I'll point out, we'll come back, of course, to the deflate bitstream in a few minutes. Deflate blocks are bitstream based, which means that the a particular block, so block zero, could have size, uh, let's, I don't know, 57 bits or something. And then block one could have size 93 bits. Um, and so what that means is that uh, block one could actually start in the middle of a byte, and that's allowed because deflate is just a bit stream. So deflate doesn't really care that much about bytes. There are points in the deflate scheme where we'll see bytes showing up, uh, but in general, deflate doesn't care that much about bytes. Um, and so blocks can start and end at arbitrary bit positions, but the gzip container, of course, because it's a file on disk, needs to be byte aligned. And byte alignment is therefore enforced um, for the compressed segment, which means that by the time we get to the footer, we're back on byte aligned data. So that requires that the compressed data, the bitstream for deflate, has to be padded out to be byte aligned after the last block of data. And we'll, we'll see this from the other point of view when we talk about the bitstream itself. Now, after the compressed uh, data segment is over, we then have this footer. Um, the idea behind the footer seems to be to provide a decompression program once it's done decompressing with some information for checking its work, for making sure that, what it, that the data it actually produced, that it decompressed, actually matched what was originally sent into the compressor. So for verifying that, that compre lossless compression has actually been achieved. One reason this can be helpful in container formats is even if the container itself isn't being used as an archival format, often you use compressed um, formats to store archives. And so it could be a backup or something. And if you're storing it on some, uh, on some storage media where you're worried about data corruption, so maybe storing it on a tape or something, um, then you might be worried about what happens if a few bits got screwed up in the compressed segment, but not screwed up enough that the decompressor noticed. Wouldn't it be great if I could verify that the data that came out was actually reasonably likely to be what I expected? And so for that purpose, the footer provides two mechanisms. The first one is, and this is a mandatory component, which means if, you, if you're writing a simple gzip encoder, you have no choice choice but to compute this value. The first element is a checksum, a checksum using an algorithm called CRC32, which is a decent algorithm to compute a checksum as long as you're not worried about like cryptographic security or anything like that. So of course, for hash values, for anything else, for signing certificates, of course, do not use, don't use a checksum like this. But CRC32 is a reasonably simple checksum that you can use just to, to verify that a set of data is what you expect it to be. It's not resilient against malicious attack. Not that we expect that to be the case in a course like this. Um, so this is a 32-bit numerical value um, computed by a specific algorithm. So actually the RFC contains pseudocode for an algorithm to compute this, this checksum. It's stored as a numerical value, which means that rule number one applies, uh, and it's stored as the first four bytes of the footer. Uh, now, because you shouldn't need to care too much about that, I have included in the A2 starter package um, some code to compute that checksum. So as, as you'll hear when I talk about the starter package more in a few minutes, the starter packet act actually contains enough um, code to deal with the header and footer for you. You might have to modify it, but it already generates a compliant header and footer, so you can focus on this, on the stuff in the middle. After the CRC32, the last four bytes of the .gz container is the size of the uncompressed data in bytes. So it's an, un it's an unsigned integer value, which means it's a number, so rule number one applies. It's the total number of bytes in the original uncompressed input. Um, and that, that's one, if, if you're the decompressor and you don't want to deal with checksums, you could use this as a very, very basic check that your decompression was reasonably likely to have succeeded. So obviously, if I tell you that I, that I had 15 bytes of original data and you only produce four or you produce 5,000, that's a sign maybe you've made a mistake as the decompressor. Okay, so what about that starter code I keep talking about? Um, so I've provided two packages of starter code because this is a course that's trying to 
sit on the fence. Um, I've provided a C package and a C++ package, so you can write your encoder in either. The task for assignment two is to write a gzip encoder. The starter code is a very basic encoder that, that actually generates a valid .gz file. It reads uncompressed data from standard input, and then it produces a valid gzip uh, format file with all the header and footer fields present, including the checksums and everything else, but the data is stored uncompressed. So there's no compression happening, that is your task. Now, how am I able to store uncompressed data in a gzip file? It turns out that deflate has a mode that allows you to store uncompressed data which might seem counterintuitive, or maybe you can catch on for why that's a useful thing, but I'll explain why in a few minutes. So your task for assignment two is to take that starter code, or not, I, I don't really care if you use the starter code, as long as your code ends up working, um, is to take that starter code or your own, start from scratch, uh, your own code, um, and to develop a .gz encoder that achieves compression and speed comparable to the actual gzip program. And how you strike this balance is your business. Uh, you'll see if you take a look at the specification that if you can achieve amazing otherworldly compression, we don't care as much about speed, and vice versa. If you can produce a compressor that is incredibly fast, but still somewhat competitive with gzip, um, even if its compression falls a bit short, also we'll take that into consideration as well. Um, and so as far as how we measure the correctness of your code, for this assignment, because there are so many variables in play, um, your code is considered correct as long as I can decompress the resulting file with gzip-d. If I use a real gzip decompressor and I can decompress the output of your program and of course it comes out correct so if it decompresses and matches the original input then your program is considered correct that's it because you can't just diff a gzip file against what the standard encoder produces because there are so many choices a compressor can make and we'll learn that the gzip encoder the one that you're likely to have on your own machine may not even make the best decisions at all times because it's trying to strike a balance between compression performance and speed now, some of the marks, as I mentioned a minute ago, will be given for ingenuity, even in cases where you don't get good compression as a result. Because I understand that in the time you have to develop this, you might have lots of clever ideas that you could justify on paper. You could explain how they could produce good results on certain cases, but you may not be able to refine them to the point where they produce the exciting results you want. Some marks will be given if you can show you've successfully implemented an advanced feature, um, even if it's not as impressive as you might have wanted it to be. Um, now, as far as debugging, uh, that's a bit of a challenge. That's something, as I said, I mentioned earlier, my own experience trying to implement a gzip encoder based on the RFC, reverse engineering other people's source code. So the source code for the gzip encoder, that um, the standard one that seems to come with, with, with every Linux machine, the source code for that is written in a way that is readable, but you're reading code, not comments. It, it requires a lot of reverse engineering. Um, so I don't want to subject you to that. So if you use the gzip decompressor and you've generated an invalid archive, you've, you've generated a gzip file that is incorrect in some way, the gzip decompressor does have a mode to give you error messages, but the error messages are not very helpful. Uh, and what's really annoying about that, having looked at the source code for gzip, is that it turns out internally it does actually have a very advanced, like it's pretty good um, internally. It has a, a good infrastructure for um, catching different kinds of errors at different places in the code. But as far as generating an error message, all of the possible errors just sort of get turned into a small number of generic errors. So this command is not very good at debugging um, uh, gzip format files. It'll tell you whether or not the file is valid, but it won't tell you very much else. And in many cases, the complaint is something that doesn't help you. Like, oh, the checksum didn't work out. But the reason the checksum didn't work out was because there was a problem in the deflate bitstream, but it wouldn't tell you what it is. Okay, all of this is turning into a sales pitch for a Python program that I have written, that I have provided, called gzstat.py. Um, gzstat.py is basically a decompressor. So it's essentially a full gzip decompressor. Um, that will attempt, do its very best to read any .gz file you give it and print out a detailed breakdown of everything it sees. So it'll tell you about the contents of the header, it'll tell you about every block in the deflate bitstream. If there's a mistake, if something goes wrong, then it will fail, of course. It'll do its best to give you an error message, or at least it will print out whatever it can tell you about the file before it hits the error, which means hopefully you can do more fine-tuned debugging. So it, like you can locate the problem in your compressed file faster. So so I strongly encourage the very first thing maybe you should do for assignment two, besides making sure the starter code compiles, is try out gzstat on a few different uh, gzip, gzip 
uh, format files. So maybe try it out on the result of compressing some stuff yourself with a standard encoder, but also try it out on the, what comes out of the A2 starter code. And there's a, a specific gzip file I'm going to talk about at the end of this lecture um, that uh, I really encourage you to try it out on because there are a whole bunch of slides describing in minute detail the contents of that gzip file. And again, we'll get there in a few slides. All right, so we have talked about the header and the footer, and we've, we've agreed that whatever goes in the middle is apparently in deflate format. Um, and so uh, deflate bit streams uh, are what we stick in this, in this middle bit here, and they have a different internal format than the gzip container. And as I said, really we want to think of there being a separation. The G, whatever part of the program is parsing the gzip container is not the same as whatever is handling the deflate bitstream and vice versa. The deflate bitstream internally is supposed to be a, num a bunch of different blocks, each of which can be some arbitrary number of bits. Um, how many blocks are in a particular file is, for the most part, pretty much a choice of the compressor. So if you're compressing a file that's, you know, megabytes or gigabytes in size, maybe you choose to generate a thousand or a million different blocks, or maybe you generate just one. That is your choice. There are lots of different reasons, as I'll come back to at the end, why you might want to use a smaller or larger number of blocks. Um, there are three different block types available, and there are simple block types, and there are complicated block types. Only one of the different block types, which is block type 0, the first one that we're going to cover, has a size limit. So block type 1 and block type 2 um, can support blocks of any length. Which means if you wanted to, if you use only block type 1 or block type 2, you could make a file with just one block in it, up to the natural limits of the format. So it turns out a .gz file actually has limits on its size, um, and you can see that because of this i size value in the header. Because i size is 4 bytes long, I suppose I can't make a gzip archive that's any larger than, uh, whose size is a number I cannot store in 4 bytes. Whatever, uh, I think for our for the purposes of the assignment, we're not going to worry about making archives that big anyway. So deflate itself, again, is different from gzip, and the, the, the format specification of deflate as well, the, the closest to a standardized format for deflate is given in RFC 1951. This isn't really the only documentation for the deflate format because, again, deflate originated in this piece of commercial software. And it was only a few years later, so in 1996, that RFC 1951 came out. And RFC 1951 was written by somebody other than the original designer of deflate. So one could argue there could be different sources of documentation. As far as a standard, and the one we are going to accept as authoritative, because it's the one behind the gzip format that we are using, I'm going to claim that it's RFC 1951. So one thing I should add here, and I said this earlier, is RFC 1951 is a standards document, and yes, it's work. I mean, reading standards documents isn't what most people do with their leisure time. But you know, as far as standards documents that I have had to read, it's actually pretty good. I, I don't like reading standards documents. I don't think anybody does. Um, but you know, on balance, um, once you get past a few things that are a little bit vague, once you figure those out, once you know a bit about the format, RFC 9051 is actually a pretty nice read. Um, it actually is pretty interesting. So it's laid out in a format, in, in, a, in a narrative format that actually allows you to understand not only what bits go where, but sort of some logic behind why the scheme works the way it does. Uh, I've tried to reflect that in this lecture, but I really encourage you, when you're writing your assignment too, take a look at it. I mean, there are some things in there, bits, little bits and pieces of details, where when you have questions like, why does it do it this way? Sometimes the RFC can help. Now, sometimes it can't, and in that case, we're sort of left to, to you know, make assumptions. But a lot of times, it can help you understand why do they make this weird decision. Okay, so in any event, here is what each block in the, defa in the, in the deflate bitstream looks like. So the basic format of a block is pretty lightweight, which makes sense because the goal of the bitstream, unlike the gzip container, the goal of the bitstream is to do one thing and do it well. Our goal is compression. We want to save bits. And I mentioned in a previous lecture that I sort of view deflate as being like an intricate mechanical watch. Tons of tiny little precision fitted gears fitted together, uh, all designed to produce perfect motion with great accuracy. In the same way, I think that deflate is designed to save one bit uh, wherever it can, to squeeze as many bits as possible out of the data, to compress everything as much as possible. And it does therefore achieve pretty good compression in lots of cases. But it's really worth um, giving some credit to the amount of intricacy behind the scheme, which I think by the end of this lecture, this odyssey, I think you'll agree with me. What's really bizarre is we'll talk about BZIP in a couple of lectures. BZIP isn't nearly as intricate. 
bzip internally, its bitstream format actually often wastes bits. It does things that seem to be sort of visibly inefficient, and yet bzip often wins because bzip relies on, I guess, more powerful underlying compression technology. Okay, we'll get there. Um, the basic format of a block um, begins with a single bit that is a flag, yes or no, is this the last block in the stream? Um, the reason is because there's really no other way for uh, the decompressor to know, once it's done with this block, is the next bit up? Is that going to be the beginning of the footer, or is that going to be the beginning of another compressed block? Because gzip is designed to be decoded with full streaming, so there's no way for the gzip decompressor to know whether I'm hitting the last eight bytes of the file or not. So you have to have some way of telling it, giving it some warning when the compressed bitstream is about to end. And that is done by setting this flag to tell you whether or not this is the last block in the stream. So is last is set to one for the last block and zero otherwise. Um, and then um, the next two bits are the block type. So the block type is a number. So the block types are numbers one, zero, one, two, and well, at least allegedly, there could be a block type three. So this is a number. It's a two-bit value, but it's a number, which means when you push the block type into the stream, rule number one applies. I remember vividly, it was implementing my own encoder. It was the encoding of B type was the first place I got confused about rule number one. The RFC maybe isn't as clear as it ought to be that no, that's a number. B type, when we talk about B type 1, 0, which I guess is block type 2, that's a number. So you push the 0 first. Even though, yes, it sounds like B type 1, 0, we should set the first bit to be, to be zero, 1 and the second bit to be 0. Nope, it's a number. Rule number 1 applies. And then after the block type, once the decompressor, once you've told the decompressor what block type to use, the remainder of the block is some stream of bits. Now the content of the bitstream now corresponds to the block type, and the bitstream corresponding to each block type is a little bit different. So we can just pivot right into talking about that. So there are these block type choices. It's a two-bit value. B type is a two-bit value, so there can be at most four different block types. Um, for reasons that I think will make sense, I think the designer ran out of steam after block type 2. Block type 2 is a little bit complicated. So mercifully, and I think you'll be out of patience by the end of this lecture, mercifully, there is no block type 3. Uh, and it turns out, I think, that block types are numbered in increasing complexity. So block type 0 is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. On the other hand, there's no compression in block type 0. It's uncompressed. And this is sort of good because this means we can work our way up this mountain because it's going to be quite a climb. If we start at the, at, at, at sea level, we work our way up, we can get to block type 0. Here's block type 0. We can make base camp there. We keep climbing and the mountain gets a little bit steeper and then we hit block type 1. Okay, that's a bit of a climb. And then, I don't know, we sort of hit an asymptote here, and then somewhere up there is block type 2. So okay, it's going to be a bit of an ascent, but you know, maybe it's better to start out with a gentle slope. Let's start by talking about block type 0. So the goal of block type 0 is to store uncompressed data. And there are a few reasons that this actually might be valuable. Now really, I mean, even if we didn't have any reason to do that in practice, one great thing about block type 0 is that, if nothing else, it's a good debugging option. Because if you're trying to design a gzip encoder, you'd like to be able to get to a valid gzip file as fast as possible. So having the ability to generate block type 0, which is what the starter code already does, before you work on more complicated bit streams, is a good way of checking your work. Okay, so block type 0, which is b type equals 0, stores uncompressed data. We've already talked about these two fields, the beginning of the block. Um, it, because the data is going to be uncompressed and the data came in as bytes, I interpret some of I interpret this next feature as a way of keeping everything byte aligned. So because the data is going to be uncompressed anyway, it can be useful to make sure that there are no weird arbitrary byte boundaries. Um, because that way, when you look at a hex dump, your uncompressed data is just sitting there byte for byte inside the, the bytes of the hex dump. So for that reason, I believe in block type 0, after the B type, um, so I'm, I'm now 3 bits into my block after B type, um, the next thing we do is emit 5 bits of padding. So padding can be, I guess, theoretically anything, but please make sure that they are zero bits. Because although padding can be arbitrary, I think everybody should expect that you set the padding to always be zero for the sake of consistency. This means that as of this point here, the bitstream is again byte aligned, assuming that the beginning of a block happened at a byte boundary, which may or may not be the case. Uh, okay, that's good because that means that all the re remaining values, if the block was originally byte aligned, all the remaining values are now byte aligned, which might make debugging a little bit easier. After the padding, we've got a 16-bit value, which will be the length of the uncompressed data. So you're going to store a bunch of uncompressed data 
later in the block, you need to tell the decompressor how much of it there's going to be. Uh, and so this is going to be stored as a 16-bit value. It is a number because it's the length, therefore rule number one applies. Okay, um, the next value, this is a weird one, and I still don't have a good explanation. Y years after originally uh, teaching this course, I still have not thought of a good explanation for why we actually need this. The best thing I can come up with is maybe some extra error checking feature, but that, that's sort of out of character for deflate. Um, but in any event, the next thing we have in the block is this 16-bit value, which is just the bitwise complement of the length. So if my length is some 16-bit value, I then flip all the bits and store it again in the next 16 bits. Now, this, it's a bit tenuous, but rule number one applies to this as well. I mean, it's sort of true that the bitwise complement of something isn't really the same type, it's not really a number in the same way as the original length was. I don't know, that's one of the great mysteries of the universe. In any event, rule number one applies. So in, just to recap, in block type zero, we store the length of the block, then the bitwise complement of the length of the block, so duplicate information basically, which is odd. Um, it again might be some kind of error detection feature. Um, and so just to be clear, in, in when I'm writing a bitwise complement, that's the C uh, bitwise complement operator, the tilde. Uh, then after the two length values, uh, I'm going to have that number of bytes of uncompressed data. Uh, because this block type stores the length explicitly as a number, which block types 1 and 2 do not do, because it does this, that means there is going to be a limit on the size of the block, because my number is 16 bits, and therefore the maximum length I can support is 2 to the 16 minus 1, so that number of bytes. Uh, and so currently the A2 starter code encodes all blocks as type 0, so it generates a valid GZ file, but it does no compression. Uh, now, that's good because it's a great debugging mechanism. I, I can design an encoder that generates a valid file before I do the compression itself because the compression is a bit nasty. Um, but I should point out that block type 0 can be useful for other reasons. So if you're, the, uh, if you're a compressor producing a deflate bitstream, uh, you will probably want to choose which block type you use for each piece of data based on the characteristics of that data. Because you know that for block type 1 and block type 2, where you could get really good compression, you could also get expansion. And so if you're a compressor and you observe that a particular chunk of data does not seem to be easily compressible, so it's incompressible for some reason, in other words, if you were to use block type 2 or block type 1, you get a huge expansion. If you notice that, then maybe it's better just to store it as type 0. I mean, sure, you're getting no compression, but on the other hand, you're not getting that much expansion. If you look at this, uh, for each 65k block of data, you're getting 5 bytes of expansion. That's pretty good. If in block type 2 you were getting an expansion of 20%, certainly block type 0 would be better. So block type 0 is a sort of fail-safe. It exists as a way for the compressor, a sort of safety valve for the compressor to use just in case it encounters data that it can do nothing with. Um, and that's great because it does actually sort of cap the amount of expansion you ever would expect to see in an ideal case. If your compressor is good at choosing block type 0 where it needs it as your safety valve, then you can assume your file won't expand dramatically. You might not get compression, but you wouldn't get too much expansion, just 5 bytes per 65k. Uh, and so the slides agree with me, a bit late to the party slide. All right, so that's block type 0. Now let's talk about block type 1. Uh, okay, so block types 1 and 2 uh, allow the use of LZSS and prefix codes. If you take a look at the RFC, the RFC insistently says LZ77. Uh, and I mentioned in the last lecture that I disagree with that, and I think you will probably understand my reasoning once you've seen it. Because what we end up working with are back references encoded as uh, length and distance pairs, as well as literals encoded as literals, and they are mixed freely. So you'll notice we've got two literals next to each other here, two back references next to each other here. As we saw in the last lecture, that is a feature of LZSS, among many other things. None of this weird triple encoding business, so it's not LZ77. But the RFC calls it that. That's not cool because poor S and S aren't getting any credit. Um, the RFC also refers to Huffman coding insistently. It just keeps saying Huffman coding, whereas it turns out that really um, deflate uses prefix coding. It does place some restrictions on the prefix code, but doesn't require that you derive your prefix code using Huffman coding. As I mentioned a couple lectures ago, uh, this is, uh, I think, a function of Huffman coding becoming sort of metonymy for the words prefix coding, because if you're going to do prefix coding, you probably will use Huffman coding or some derivative of the Huffman coding algorithm.
So when you use block type one or two, um, we take our original data and then encode it uh, to produce, uh, using LZSS to produce back references as we see fit. And we know if we're encoding LZSS, it's our decision how many back references to emit, and then run the result through a prefix code. Now, you should, I think, have a question in mind already of, wait a minute, I'm using a prefix code to represent these symbols. Okay, so I guess S could get a code like 100, and L could get a code like 11. Okay, that makes sense. What do I use for this? Am I encoding each back reference as a separate symbol? Does it get its own little prefix code value? Because that seems a bit worrying because there are lots of possible back references. The number of possible symbols could be pretty damn huge if I give each back reference its own encoding. Okay, so before we talk about the nuts and bolts of block type one in terms of the bit stream, I guess I have to unpack that point. Um, and then once we figure out, um, once we have our back references, we then apply this prefix code, but I need to explain how the back references are represented uh, before I go any further. Uh, okay, so first, how do I do the LZSS coding? Uh, well, LZSS uses uh, for deflate a, a window of 32,768 past characters. And to be clear, these are past characters of input, not necessarily characters in the same block. So if I'm encoding this block of data, but there was a block before it that ended with X, Y, Z, I'm allowed to generate back references that go back here, that go back past the beginning of the current block. Because the assumption is the decompressor did decompress the previous block, so it will have that data. Um, whether you do this is a different question, because it can be a little bit annoying to encode, to add that to your code. That might be something you add later, but that is allowed. In deflate, a back reference is allowed to go back to before the beginning of the current block, as long as there was some other block of data beforehand. It can refer back to 32,000 characters of previous data, whether or not that was in the same block. Um, LZSS for deflate uses a look-ahead distance of 258 characters. And you might already have seen a few cases of weird numbers showing up. That's going to happen a lot more. We're going to see a lot of numbers that don't line up the way that we as computer scientists sort of want them to. We feel sort of like the most, that we get the best resolution as computer scientists if we see powers of two. The number 258, or another number we're going to see later, 285, feel oddly dissonant to us. They feel sort of like intervals that leave in some tension, because we want powers of two. We like numbers like 256 or 512. 285 just seems like magic. It seems like a magic number. But deflate, as this intricate machine, this watch with all these intricate pieces, deflate actually has strangely good reasons for using that number. Um, there are reasons that are based on the original design, but you can sort of follow the logic of the designer a little bit. Um, one thing I'm going to add is we're actually switching convention here, and it's, I hope it's not too confusing. I was aware of this switch when I made the previous lecture, and I chose to keep it in. I felt like um, in the previous lecture, uh, it was a better idea to have our back references encoded as distance followed by length. So how far back, and then how far, how long is the back reference? Um, however, deflate doesn't do that. Deflate encodes the first value of the back reference, and this is significant, so it's not just a matter of how I'm drawing it on the slide. Um, the first thing in a back reference pair in deflate is always the length, and the second thing is the distance. So how far back you go is actually encoded as the second part of the back reference pair. And there are good reasons for that, I think. Um, and it's basically because the set of possible lengths is smaller than the set of possible distances. And because of the way d d deflate differentiates, that probably is a good idea. Now, I should add, as usual, that how many back references get emitted is sort of the compressor's decision. That's at its, its discretion. You're not going to get as good compression unless you leverage back references. But if you choose to, to emit no back references whatsoever, then that's still valid. You might not get the same mark you'd get otherwise, but you could focus on the prefix coding aspect first and come back in and do the back references later. So what I'll come back to is that point I made a few minutes ago, which is that um, if I look at the result of LZSS, which is all these, if we treat each individual piece as a symbol, where a back reference is one complete symbol, I might get into some trouble. Because that means my total set of possible symbols is absolutely massive. Because each back reference can have a length anywhere from, uh, well, I guess the length wouldn't be zero, from uh, 1 to 258. And it can have a distance anywhere from 1 to 32,768. Um, so that means that the number, if I have one symbol representing the entire back reference, the number of possible symbols is absolutely massive. Now that in and of itself isn't really that big of a problem. There are ways around that. So I can have a huge symbol set, but only use a small number of symbols. And I can tell the decompressor which symbols I'm using. That would require overhead, but there's going to be overhead no matter what. 
The real issue is it's really hard to generate a prefix code um, intelligently based on that because if I generate a lot of very similar back references, so there's three, so link three distance 10, there's another link three distance 10, but also link four distance 10 or link three distance nine, these are all sort of similar. And I could have data that's full of a lot of very similar back references, but if I try and generate a prefix code, I apparently have three different symbols, one of which has frequency two and two of which have frequency one. And so even if I am able to treat every possible back reference as a separate symbol, I get a certain form of maybe fragmentation of my, of my frequency space. Um, I have lots and lots of, of individual symbols that are sort of similar. Like the back references that have um, distance 10 are sort of similar, at least in having distance 10. And the back references that have link three are similar. But if I treat back references as the pair, for, for one symbol to be a pair, I end up with a sort of fragmentation where it's very hard to design a very good prefix code. And there are just a very large number of possible symbols. So I could treat uh, every literal as a symbol or every length distance pair as a symbol, but there are just too many length distance pairs. So I end up with this huge code tree and a very large number of um, uh, symbols that have very low probabilities. So I end up with a large number of symbols with very long encodings. Um, and so I think the designer of, the, of Deflate noticed that and they had to come up with some uh, compromise. And boy, is it a compromise. So there, there are quite a few facets of uh, the, the approach Deflate takes, but I think it, it deserves quite a bit of credit. It, it's a, it is a little bit tedious, but I think it does uh, achieve its goal. Um, so the first observation is, well, actually, if I'm going through decoding, so if I've generated an encoding using a prefix code where each literal gets its own encoding, obviously, if this is my stream of symbols, I need some way for the decompressor to know that I'm working on a back reference. And the LZSS proposal in the original LZSS paper was just use a bit flag for that. Deflate does something a little bit more complicated, um, which I think is an improvement. So what Deflate observes, which, which is the observation on this slide, is that as long as you know you're at the beginning of a back reference, you don't have to encode the entire back reference as its own symbol, just part of the back reference so that when the decompressor sees it, it knows to begin reading a back reference. And so what Deflate does is it encodes each literal as its own symbol, and then using the same alphabet of symbols, so part of the same alphabet, it also encodes the length of the back reference. If the decompressor sees a symbol corresponding to a length, and not a literal, the decompressor would know, well, this must be a back reference, so a distance has to be coming next. And that's why we don't actually have to encode the distance as part of the symbol. We can just encode the length and assume that the decompressor will know that a distance must be forthcoming and therefore decode the distance separately. And so deflate does that. It keeps lengths separate from distances, but lengths are kept together with literals. So it uses one um, set of symbols for all possible lengths and all possible literals. And so uh, I guess you could argue, therefore, that the primary prefix code that deflate uses is the one that encodes literals and length values. Um, whenever deflate sees a symbol corresponding to a length, then it knows there's going to be a distance following. And so a separate prefix code is used to encode the distance values. So we now have two prefix codes we're working on, the main one for literals and lengths and a separate one for distances. Um, so the prefix code is generally in the RFC called the literal length code. Uh, I'm going to save some bandwidth in this lecture by using abbreviations. Um, I'm going to call it the LL code uh, because we're going to need to talk about it a lot. So the LL code is the prefix code used to represent literals and lengths. Um, there are 286 possible symbols in the LL code. Um, those symbols are all of the usual 8-bit literals that we know and love. So symbols two, 0 through 255 are 8-bit literal values. So when you see the symbol 65 in base 10, that would be the letter uppercase A. That would be encoded as the literal 65. Okay, um, and then symbol 256 is a special symbol that represents the end of block marker. So in blocks one and two, block type one and block type two, we do not in hard code the length of the block into the block header. Instead, the data just keeps going until you hit symbol 256. Symbol 256 is a marker saying the block is over, move on to the next one. Um, and then symbols 257 through 285, which I'm going to call the length symbols, are used to represent lengths. Uh, and you'll notice that, wait, the number of possible lengths, the look-ahead distance, is 258. 
So there should be 258 different lengths that I can represent. And yet, I only have, um, what, a 29? That's a weird number. 29 possible length symbols. Okay, something doesn't add up here. Um, and the idea is, again, that if we ha have an extra, a special symbol for every possible length, we're going to really dilute our space of total symbols. I've got more length symbols than I have literals. So I'm going to end up with lots of long encodings. But some lengths are less likely to occur than others. If I'm thinking about back references that I'm going to see in practice, I'll probably see a lot of short back references. But I won't see that many back references of a sort of arbitrary length. If the maximum length is 258, I might see a lot of back references of length 258, because maybe I end up with specific cases of extremely long runs of the same character. So if I have a thousand A's in a row, I could generate a bunch of back references of the maximum length to encapsulate that. But on the other hand, what about length, I don't know, 167? I mean, how likely am I going to find a back reference of that length? I certainly want to use that length if I have it, but it's not nearly as likely as a back reference of length 3. So maybe introducing a certain bias where some back references, uh, some lengths are easier to represent than others or require a shorter encoding would be productive instead of having a separate symbol for each length. Um, now it's true that prefix coding accommodates this to some extent because of course less common symbols will get longer encodings. But the designer of deflate figured that even before prefix coding um, gets to, to have a crack at it, we should still uh, try and represent less common lengths uh, with uh, a symbol so as not to pollute the base of total symbols. So maybe batch them together. And we do exactly that. So um, symbols representing short lengths will represent only one length. So symbol 257 is for back references of length 3. Symbol 260 is for back references of length 6. On the other hand, as the length gets longer and longer, and therefore I suppose less and less common, a single length symbol represents a range of possible lengths. So for example, symbol 276 represents the range 59 through 66. So any back reference in that range, 59 up to 66 inclusive, will use symbol 276. Um, and the ranges get bigger and bigger as the length gets larger. So here, um, symbol 284 represents a length um, any length between 227 and 257 inclusive. Uh, and so the range gets larger. Now we still have to talk about how exactly do we represent where you are inside of that range. Um, so there are going to be 258 possible lengths because the look ahead distance is 258. And so I obviously want to represent any length in that range. Um, but I don't want to create a symbol for every possible length because there'd be too many symbols. So instead, we define 29 symbols, which again is a very strange number. Um, and this, I think, is the result of the designer making some decisions, sort of hacking away at their code. So that's why the number is so arbitrary. And some symbols represent a range of possible lengths. For common lengths, so the shorter ones or the maximum, the range is going to be size 1. So the symbol uniquely represents one length. Um, as the um, length goes up, the size of the range increases. So symbol 265, the size of the range is 2. Um, whereas symbol 269, the size of the range is 4. Our size is going to be 8 by the time we get up to symbol 276 and so on. Uh, and then the question is, how do I represent an exact length? So if I know that my length is, I don't know, length, length 61 or something, what do I do? Well, what I'll do is first say, OK, which symbol does it go with? So I'll say, generate symbol 276. I've got length 61. OK, so I generate symbol 276. And then I have to say, how far is so 276 represents everything from 59 up to 66. So I'll say, generate symbol 256, and then use an offset of 2 into the range. So 276 is going to start at number 59, range, length 59. I want length 61, so I'll give you a separate offset value that tells you where I am inside of the range. And so we can also visualize the set of length symbols by the, the uh, beginning of the range, the, the um, start point of that range, uh, and then um, the number of bits we need to represent an, an offset into the range. And you'll actually, if you stare at this, you'll realize that the sizes of ranges generally are powers of two, which is for good reason. And that's why uh, the range boundaries seem so arbitrary at higher numbers, because it's the cumulative effect of all of these offsets. Because we obviously want to start the range for symbol 274 should start wherever the range for symbol 273 left off. So the idea is to generate a particular length, we first find the um, symbol 
corresponding to that length. So the largest symbol number below that length. So if I want length, I don't know, length 25, I would use symbol 270 because the um, lower bound of the range is 23 and the next symbol up is lower bound 27. So symbol 270 can be used to represent length 20, uh, 25. However, I have to give both the symbol 270 and a two bit offset um, which is immediately after the symbol in the stream, a two-bit offset will tell me how far into the range I am going. Uh, and so I think I can demonstrate this more effectively with examples. So if I want to represent the, the length 21, I would go find the length symbol 269, which represents uh, lengths in the range 19 uh, through 22. And then I would use the two-bit offset, um, uh, which in this case would be so 19 plus 2 equals 21, so the value is going to be 2, and that's the 2 bits 1, 0, that would be used to get us to 21 from the base 19. If I want the length 202, well then I choose symbol 283, which starts at, at, at uh, the base length 195, uh, so 202 is 195 plus 7, so I encode as my 5-bit offset, I encode the 5-bit encoding of the binary value 7, that's my offset. If I want the length 6, I would just generate symbol 260 by itself. I don't need an offset, because there are no offset bits because the range has size one. So hopefully you can see this provides some flexibility. I get short um, for links that are short and therefore probably more common. I just generate a symbol. For links that are longer, I generate a symbol and a certain number of offset bits to index into the range. And in general, if I have a particular length, what I want to do basically is find the largest numbered length symbol um, such that the base length is less than the length I care about. So if, for example, I care about length 55, I would choose symbol 275 because it is the largest numbered one whose base length is less than or equal to, two, uh, to my length of 55. And then I compute the offset by just subtracting off the base base length from the length that I'm representing. Uh, and notice, like I said a minute ago, that the width of the interval increases as uh, the length increases based on the logic that arbitrary lengths in these ranges are probably relatively unlikely, and so it makes sense to not, not um, prioritize them over shorter lengths that are probably going to occur more often. Uh, and then, as I said, that longest length is an exception because really this length, 258, is a surrogate for any back reference longer than 258. If I notice 500, um, a back reference of length 500, I can't actually use 500. So instead, I'll just break it down into a back reference of length 258 followed by another back reference. So 258 becomes a stand-in for anything uh, whose length is at least 258. Um, and so it makes sense that that length symbol might be more frequent than, for example, the length um, 1. 193 or something similar. Now, then there's the question of distances. So remember that because um, when I see a length symbol, if I'm decompressing, if I see a length symbol, I know that I'm looking at a back reference. I'm not required to encode distances with the same alphabet as I do literals and lengths. So the scheme takes advantage of this and uses a separate set of symbols to represent distances. And it's with the same logic as it was for lengths, except that the number of possible distances is, of course, much larger. So the distance code, so when I talk about distances, I'm going to refer to the distance code because it's a separate set of symbols, but it's also represented by a prefix code. The distance code uh, has 30 distance symbols. That is to say, if you look at a deflate bitstream, you will see um, in, in any deflate bitstream ever, the set of distance symbols you will see is limited to these 30 symbols, symbol 0 through symbol 29. The RFC has this peculiar note that the distance code has 32 symbols. So there actually are apparently these phantom symbols 30 and 31. But it then says explicitly distance codes 30 and 31 will never actually occur. So apparently we're supposed to give them enough respect to acknowledge their existence, but also we will never see them. So if we're never going to see them, then I am not going to think about them any further. That's, that's a weird philosophical question that I am in very little of a mood to interrogate today. So there are 30 distance symbols as far as we are concerned. Uh, and each symbol corresponds to a range of possible distances. And as before, uh, the ranges tend to be smaller uh, the smaller the distance is, because it makes sense that my back references will probably be relatively uh, recent. And even if I have a file where back references go far into the past, frankly, my compressor might not generate those back references for a lot of different reasons, which I'll come to later in the lecture. 
Because it turns out, as you're seeing, that because back reference encodings um, will expand in length as you as length or distance gets longer, there will come a, a point of diminishing returns. Where even if I can find a back reference at I don't know distance fifteen thousand, if the back reference isn't very long, maybe it's easier just to emit literals because having to spend all those extra bits encoding the offset, encoding the length and distance symbols, might negate the compression advantage. So as with length symbols, the size of the range increases as we go up. We can also, we can visualize this as both the range, so 13 through 16, or a base distance and some offset defined in terms of a number of bits. And as I said, notice that I need, you know, 12 or 13 bits um, for my offset if my distance is really large. 12 or 13 bits is a lot. If I'm generating a back reference of, I don't know, length 3 or something at distance um, 25,000, then a back reference of length 3 at distance 25,000 needs enough, uh, needs bits to accommodate the length symbol, the distance symbol, the length offset, although for distance, for length three, the offset would be zero bits, and 13 other bits for the distance offset. A back reference of length three, so the text ABC, frankly, it's quite possible that with 13 bits, I could just encode the text ABC as literals, because maybe the letter A, the letter B, and the letter C get a, you know, three or four bit encoding um, with our prefix code. So keep that in mind. Um, there are lots of reasons why this sort of implies that larger distance back references should only be used if they're sort of long enough to warrant um, actually using them, because maybe I'm not achieving compression otherwise. And, the, and in exchange, I get lower overhead on short distances. Uh, okay, so in any event, um, the actual number of bits that I use to encode the length symbol or the distance symbol, that could vary. I don't know in advance how many bits I'll need to encode symbol number 14 or distance symbol number 3 because it's subject to prefix coding. The number of offset bits is fixed, though. So the offset bits are not participating in my prefix code. If I generate length a uh, distance symbol 7, regardless of how many bits distance symbol 7 is encoded into, I will always generate a 2-bit offset right after that symbol. So the offset bits are fixed. The maximum representable distance is this number. So this is, I think, why we ended up with only uh, with the maximum distance symbol being 29, is that by the time we got to the end of the range for 29, we'd already accommodated all possible distances. So distance symbols 30 and 31 weren't needed. So they're still not needed. We're not going to think about them any further. OK, so how do we do the encoding? Now that we know a bit about the way the symbols are encoded, uh, we've got, here's a stream of input. Um, we first add an end of block marker, and then we apply LZSS. So the end of block marker is symbol number 256. Um, as in previous slides, I'm going to, when we're talking about data, we should understand that the symbol stream is a bunch of numerical values, right? Like A is the number 65. But as usual, when the number, the symbol corresponds to a printable character, I will write it down as a letter as opposed to a number just so that we can read it. So I first add my end of block marker. It's always the symbol 256, which I will represent as a number. I'll represent back references with this colon notation, but remember that the length comes before the distance in this uh, set of slides. So I apply LZSS to generate whatever back references I see fit. Remember that it is my choice um, to, as the compressor to decide whether or not to generate a back reference. And based on what I just mentioned, it turns out even if I am zealous to generate back references, they may not always be a good idea. And there's a really weird, nasty underlying version of that problem, a sort of feedback loop issue, which is that whether or not a back reference produces compression is based on the way the prefix code is constructed. But I don't know how the prefix code will look until I know what back references I'm using. So that's a, that's a thorny problem that we won't really need to address too much, although you can try to address it on assignment two. In some cases, there are certain back references, like back references of especially large distance but short length, where it might actually be easier, it might actually result in better compression to just generate literals. Um, in deflate, all back references must have length at least three. So if we scroll back a bit, we will observe that actually our very first length symbol is for length three. You're not allowed to generate back references of length one or two because the designer of the scheme determined that in that case, there's not going to be any advantage and adding length symbols, presumably for lengths one and two, would just dilute the symbol space. So if you want a back reference, it has to have length at least three. You're not allowed to generate back references of, of lengths one and two. Uh, and then I take the sequence of tokens. So here's my symbol stream. I take this and then I break it down into um, my uh, LL or distance symbols. So I, I 
hopefully at some point I, I can generate a prefix code for my LL code and my distance code. We will get there. But suppose that I have uh, an encoding already in mind. I've generated a prefix code. I take my symbol stream and I uh, apply my LL and distance codes. So I first take my back references and I break them down into a length symbol. And then these, what I've drawn on this row here, these are the numerical offset. The offset is zero, not that this is going to be the, the actual bits that are generated, but the actual offset, because my length is 3, the length symbol for 3 is 257, the offset is 0. Um, the distance 6 is distance symbol number 4, and the offset is going to be 1. Uh, and then everything else is encoded directly as a literal. So I have to take each back reference and break it up into these four values. Length symbol, length offset, distance symbol, distance offset, using the conversion table that I gave earlier. Um, the conversion tables are actually also uh, coded into the GZ stat source code. So if you want one, you can copy and paste. Just go get it from there. Um, and then I take uh, all of this, these literal and length symbols. So here's a length symbol. Here are some literals. I take all of these, and they get fed through the prefix code for literal and length symbols, the LL code. I then take any distance symbols I see and feed them through the distance code. For the offsets, I have to encode them as per the tables from earlier. So the length symbol 257 has zero bits for its offset. That means this offset actually gets encoded into nothing. It gets in, we don't actually generate any bits for this offset. This distance offset, it, if we go look at the table for distance symbols, distance symbol 4 apparently has a 1-bit offset. So I take this distance offset, the number 1, and encode it as 1-bit, which with least significant bit first, it's pretty easy. I just encode it as a single bit 1. Um, remember, though, that it, when offsets are numbers, so that means that rule number 1 applies. If I'm generating a 5-bit offset, and it's the number 7 or something, I need to push the least significant bit first. And you'll see visualizations of that later on in the lecture. Uh, this is actually saying this um, twice. The slides are, it's so important that I've said it twice. Uh, so because we haven't talked about generating prefix codes yet, let's just make one up for the sake of the example. I want to complete this example because I think it's important that you can visualize everything. So suppose that I'm using this prefix code, which really you don't have to look directly at this, just so I have some bits, so I'm showing my work. Um, I've, I've omitted all the entries of the table that are characters I'm never using. So here, suppose I'm using this prefix code here, and this is the code for the distance symbols. Okay, well in that case, I would have this. Um, the, these are the three steps from earlier. So I, I, gen I break everything down into literals, length symbols, and distance symbols. I then run them through the appropriate prefix code. So here, um, the first few bits, so I generate, there's the encoding for A, there's A again. And you'll notice in my stream, the encoding for A is 0, 1, 1. This isn't a number. This is a bit sequence. So I just push it from left to right, 0, 1, 1. If I encode a number, I would push the least significant bit first. Now, in this example, none of our numbers are more than one bit long. They're all, all we have are prefix codes and these, this single bit offset. But we'll come back to that idea in a few minutes. Um, here, I take my length symbol 257 and I generate the corresponding encoding in the LL code. Distance symbol 4 in my distance code is 0, 0, 0. So there it is. And then notice how the offsets just get sandwiched in between the symbols. So here, there is, this is, this is a zero-bit offset, so nothing happens. But this distance offset shows up right after the distance symbol. So once the decompressor reads the distance symbol, it then has to go and grab the offset, which is not encoded with a prefix code. It's just a binary value. And then we go back to encoding literals after that. Um, and of, so here is an example of using larger offsets. So of course, um, the encoded length is going to increase as the number of offset bits grows, even if I'm using the same prefix code. So even if my link symbols have short encodings, um, then these offsets are going to get larger and larger. And that's because this I, of this general idea that lar longer links and larger distances are less common. So it makes sense to um, move, to sort of push the overhead into um, larger distances or larger links. So just to, to drive home the whole rule number one business, um, notice how, so uh, the binary encoding, let's take a look at, yeah, let's take a look at the, this distance offset here. So the distance offset, if my, my distance is extremely large, so 578, my distance offset is 65 because the corresponding distance symbol, which is some symbol number 18, apparently has a large range. Um, as you know, 65 is an odd number. Um, 
so the encoding of 65 in binary is 01000001. But you'll notice that when I push it into my stream, so here is my bit stream from left to right. When I'm generating my, my encoded file, I'm pushing my bits like this. So starting at the left and working my way over. Notice that when I form my bit stream, this offset 65 gets pushed into the bit stream with the least significant bit first. So we know in binary, the least significant digit is one, but notice how that bit gets pushed first. That's because rule number one applies to offsets because they are numbers. And we can see it's happening with our length offsets as well. This is going in as five bits. Um, here I have a length offset going in as two bits. Now, of course, we know that number two in base 10 is one zero in base two, and yet, it gets pushed as zero one one because the least significant bit comes first. I wasn't kidding when I said rule number one is a big deal. Um, okay, so here's an example of encoding back references that are more complicated and a bit more exotic than the ones in the previous example. Um, now, what about the prefix codes? So uh, all prefix codes used by deflate are constructed with one standard algorithm. So just like we've seen before, um, it doesn't make much sense usually to store the actual prefix code. Instead, it makes sense to just use a set of lengths and then recover the code from the set of lengths. Um, RFC 1951 gives the standard algorithm. But I'll bet you might have seen that algorithm before somewhere. But uh, if you want that standard algorithm, it is actually in the GZ stat source code. So it's in Python, but you could easily transcribe it into C or C++. Uh, so it, it's there for the taking. Uh, because it, pseudocode forward is in the RFC, I figured I could also give you a Python version if you want an implementation to play with. Um, my recommendation is because of this property, if it is possible, I suppose, that you could use, you could design a Huffman coding implementation that always generates a set of links compatible with a standard algorithm, but that just seems like a huge uh, time sink because you have to tweak it and what if it's not correct in all cases. So instead, I strongly recommend that if you derive your own prefix codes, which to be clear only will happen in block type two, not in block type one, which we're still talking about, if you use Huffman coding, do the following. Use Huffman coding, generate a table of code lengths, and then you use the standard algorithm to generate the actual encodings. Don't use the encodings out of the tree. Even if you're sure that your tree looks the way it's supposed to, just pull the links out of the tree and then regenerate the codes using the standard algorithm. So you're sure that you have a code that complies with the deflate requirements. Now, block type one doesn't use a custom defined code. Instead, block type one dictates a specific prefix code that you are required to use. Um, and that means that we don't worry about Huffman coding just yet. We'll get to that. That'll be part of block type two. Um, and so uh, for block type one, we allow LZSS, we allow back references. And so we would use uh, this, we break the back reference up into length and distance symbols. However, the specific prefix code is not up to us. Instead, a standardized code table has been hard coded into the compressor and decompressor. So if I'm gonna build block type one, well, I'm gonna set is last and B type as usual. Um, B type of course is one in this case, not B, not zero. Um, and then I compute the bitstream uh, that I showed earlier, uh, except that the prefix codes I used are hard coded. So um, the RFC gives this table of code lengths to use for the prefix codes. And I actually wanna make one more note about the length tables. So when I take this table of lengths and I wanna generate the encodings for it, the first step is to sort it by length. Um, when I sort by length, there are probably gonna be ties. So notice how A, C, and F are all tied. Um, when I sort by length with a standard algorithm, I am required for consistency to break ties by using the numerical order of the literal, of the symbol, which means in my table of, that's sorted by lengths, when three symbols have length three, I should put the symbol with the lowest numerical value first. So A does come before C, which comes before F. So notice that, that is required. Um, so if I take this code length table and then I sort it by length, um, I would be putting symbol zero through 143 first, or actually, no, sorry, not first. I would first be putting the ones of length seven, then the ones of length eight in that order. So I would have my first be 256, then down to 279, then zero, then up to 143, then the other ones with um, length eight, so up to 287, and then 144, and so on. So keep that in mind. When I sort the table by code length, I break ties in a certain well-defined way, a pretty natural way, but it's well-defined. Um, okay, so my LL code for block type one is always 
these code lengths, the standard code with these code lengths. The distance code is also computed with a standard algorithm, but the distance code is pretty easy. I just assume that every symbol, uh, I won't even bother drawing the table, every symbol has code length 5. So I use the standard algorithm, but I assume that every symbol has code length 5. In other words, what that actually means is that you end up with um, every symbol's encoding just being its 5-bit uh, binary encoding. Although, uh, in this case, so I'll just generate a couple of those. Uh, it turns out that every symbol's encoding in this context corresponds to its 5-bit binary encoding, but it's not considered a number. So rule number one doesn't apply to this because it's a distance code. It's a prefix code value. Uh, now, you might look at this slide and say, hey, wait a minute. Isn't there a typo on the slide? What's this whole 287 business? I thought that the largest LL symbol was 285. You are 100% correct. The LL code only includes symbols 0 through 285. And yet, when you generate the prefix code for block type 1, you are required to generate prefix codes for two phantom symbols, symbol 286 and 287. If you don't, the, the generation algorithm will make a mistake. Um, so why, why are we doing it this way? What's the deal? The RFC contains this sort of vague note that just says, I, yes, I understand, symbol 286 and 270, 287 aren't real, but they are required to participate in code construction. That's all the RFC says. I suspect what happened here was the designer of the scheme originally did have a use for these two symbols and at the last minute deleted them. But they were still, you know, sort of, there were still vestiges of those symbols and codings buried inside of the, the code. And so that's why we're stuck with it. So if you generate the prefix codes for block type 1, you do have to generate prefix codes for the imaginary symbol 286 and 287. So give it a code, give it this code table and have it generate codes for 286 and 287 and then just ignore those. Um, so my recommendation uh, first is when you do assignment two, I really strongly recommend that you start your implementation by generating block type one. That allows you to focus on the basics of using prefix codes, so generating the codes with the standard algorithm, and getting LZSS and those uh, literal um, length codes and distance codes to work. So the, the uh, length symbols and the offsets and the distance symbols and their offsets. Focus on that. Do not just dive in with block type two. That will likely not be a good time. Um, my recommendation is, uh, if you want to write code that generates block type 1, begin by accumulating some chunk of data, 100k, 10k, I don't care, just choose some fixed size chunk of data. Later on, you might want to uh, adjust your logic for the size of the block to be variable. Maybe you change the block boundary based on what you observe about the data, but for now, just choose a fixed size add the end of block marker, um, then use LZSS. So probably, as I said in the last lecture, start with a linear search-based LZSS. Then break up the stream into the LL codes, uh, the LL code, distance code, and offset values, and then apply those two fixed codes that I just mentioned uh, to actually produce the bit stream. Now, there's lots of room in there to refine them and to basically copy and paste this as the, the beginning of block type 2, when you get to block type 2. Speaking of which, here we are at block type 2. Um, so, I mentioned earlier block type 2 is a bit of a thing. We've already seen LZSS, we've seen the idea of using prefix codes. Block type 2 allows you to define your very own prefix codes for the LL and distance code alphabets. To do that, we then have to add the prefix code specification to the block header, because the decompressor doesn't know what codes you've chosen unless you tell it. That's going to be a that's going to be quite a bit of trouble in a few different ways. The problem is, I have uh, this length table for my encodings, my LL code and my distance code, and it's big. And if I encode that into my block header, I have to find some way of making that as small as possible. And so pretty much all of the difficulty of block type 2 comes down to that problem. How do I convey to the decompressor my choice of prefix codes um, in a way that takes up as little space as possible? So block type 2 enables all of the features, and the designer was so exhausted after block type 2 that they never came up with a block type 3, and that's probably for the better. So first, we use LZSS compression. So whether or not you choose to generate back references, it's supported. The data is compressed with customized LL and distance code. So it has to be a prefix code, but you, the compressor, can come up with it yourself. Um, each block can use its own prefix code, and so that means that in every block of type 2, the prefix code tables, are the length tables, are encoded into the block header. Um, now, how do we do that? Well, that's going to be a bit of a tough one because the tables of lengths 
have to have links for symbol 0 all the way up to symbol 285 for the LL code. That's 285 table entries. That could be a lot. So we have to come up with a sort of meta-compression idea for how do we get the, the code length table into the block header in a small number of bits. And we do this for deflate with a variety of tricks, most of which rely on using another prefix code, which I'm going to call the CL code. I'll get to that. The CL code is a prefix code. It's also a customized prefix code, which means you also have to tell the decompressor how to use the CL code, which means you use yet another code to encode the CL code. So, well, let's just cross our fingers and dive in. I recommend if you start implementing block type 2 using this workflow. So basically the same as the block type 1 workflow. Um, so first get some data, add the end of block marker, use LZSS. Now before you go forward, before you um, uh, actually use your prefix codes, you have to generate your own prefix codes. So based on the um, LZSS stream, probably based on the uh, LL symbols and distance symbols that you see. So track their frequency across your chunk of data and then generate using Huffman code uh, some prefix code for it. Then, using what we're about to discuss in the next few slides, encode those uh, length tables for the LL and distance codes into the bit stream, and then finally actually use the prefix codes to generate the bit sequence, and then add that to the output bit stream after all of the header stuff um, produced uh, in the step before. Okay, so that's what I'm going to spend most of this, the rest of the lecture on, is how do I encode those code tables into the stream? This is going to be a bit of an acquired taste. Um, so uh, one other thing, though, is how do we compute those prefix codes? Well, the RFC insistently keeps saying Huffman coding, so I guess maybe we should try Huffman coding. But as compression experts, we, you know, we have refined taste. We ought to know the difference. There is no requirement that you use Huffman coding. And I mean, how could there be? How could the decompressor know whether you've used a proper Huffman code or not until it's done decompression? Because remember that the defining characteristic of a Huffman code is that it minimizes the value of L bar. If you're the decompressor, you don't even know what L bar is until you're done decompression, because then you can you can actually derive L bar yourself based on the encoding. Um, so of course you don't have to use an actual Huffman code, and the decompressor can't require you to. Um, the decompressor has one requirement, which is that the Kraft-McMillan inequality evaluates to exactly one. Um, so uh, we saw before that if this comes out to be less than one, that means that the prefix code doesn't capture all possible bit strings. Um, which means that there's, there is some way of improving its efficiency. Now, as you know, just because it does come out to equal one doesn't mean it's the best possible prefix code for a given application, because you could have still chosen links in a bad way. Um, but the gzip decompressor, for some reason, which makes no sense to me, the gzip decompressor will reject any um, uh, deflate bitstream where this isn't true. The reason why that makes no sense is, really, if I give you a code length table and you can generate a prefix code, which is true even if this comes out to less than one, if you can generate a prefix code, you should just use it. Why should you reject a bitstream because you don't like the prefix code? In the classic Unix mentality of um, be as liberal as possible in what you accept as input, this doesn't really hold up. And yet the gzip decompressor does it. So the gzip decompressor will just refuse to decompress, even if it's fully, even if the, the file is unambiguous, it will refuse to use any prefix code where the Kraft Macmillan inequality evaluates to less than one. Um, so whatever. Um, if you use Huffman coding, it's fine because in, when you use Huffman coding, the inequality always comes out to be one. Just keep that in mind. There's no requirement that you use uh, Huffman coding. And that's sort of helpful because it turns out actually, despite saying Huffman coding over and over again, the actual reference gzip encoder doesn't use the Huffman coding, doesn't actually use a proper Huffman code. So the issue, which we'll come to in a minute, uh, it's, it's born out of practical constraints, is that um, the actual length of each symbol's encoding is limited to be 15 bits. You are not allowed to have any symbol in the LL or distance alphabet with a, an encoding of longer than 15 bits. That's a problem though, because remember that the number of symbols, there are 286 possible symbols. So Huffman coding with a really skewed distribution, Huffman coding could assign some symbols um, an encoding of length, I don't know, like 280 bits, 284 bits. So if I use Huffman coding on an alphabet this large, I could get encodings that are way larger than 15 bits. Although that's unlikely, it is possible. So what do we do? 
Well, if you use the proper Huffman coding algorithm, the code it provides will not comply in general with this requirement. So there are a couple of options for fixing it. So you have to fix it somehow. Your encoder must ensure that every symbol has an encoding of 15 bits or less in length. So one way around the restriction is to just compute a Huffman code the usual way, and then to go look at the tree. If you notice any of the tree is deeper than level 15, you could just move nodes around a bit. So I don't know, let's, let's just draw a little tree here. So if I have a situation like this and I decide that this is too deep, well, what I could do is I could try and move some nodes around to pull some things up and push some things back down. For example, I could move this symbol down here and that frees up a little bit of space over here. I guess in this case, I wouldn't be able to move both symbols, but hopefully you get the idea. What I could do is just manipulate the tree. I could go find whatever subtree is too far down and then try and push it up by one level and then just do that recursively. Um, so, and it turns out actually that that's what's done by the um, actual gzip encoder. There are, however, other specialized, essentially variations of the original Huffman coding algorithm. There are specialized Huffman coding algorithms to generate what are called limited length prefix codes. And that's an algorithm where it will always generate the optimal prefix code of a particular maximum length. The disadvantage of the scheme where I begin hoisting trees around, so if I if I have, you know, I don't know, this subtree down here, and I decide to move it up by one level or something, is that when I'm done these manual manipulations, as we saw in the lecture on Huffman coding, if I go moving things around my tree, although I might get a valid prefix code, I might not get a prefix code with the best possible L bar. There are algorithms that will produce a optimal prefix code under a restriction to a certain length. Um, and the one that is generally considered to be sort of the, the standard algorithm is called the package merge algorithm. Um, I'd like to cover that, but I don't have time in this course. I mean, we're just chronically short of lecture time. Um, if you implement the package merge algorithm, if you go find some information, teach yourself that algorithm, you will get extra marks on assignment two for that. That's one of the ways of getting those last few marks is implementing, is learning and implementing the package merge algorithm. For what it's worth in the past in this course, people have done that and they have reported that it wasn't so bad. It is quite a bit different in a lot of ways from Huffman coding. Like it's not the same merging subtree sort of deal as Huffman coding, but it is an algorithm that people have been able to teach themselves. And if you do that, you solve this problem of ensuring that everything is at most 15 bits long. If you don't do that, you've got to do some kind of manual manipulation because there will be some inputs with really skewed frequency distributions where Huffman coding could generate very long encodings for certain symbols. Now, the most significant, as I mentioned, the, the thing about block type 2 that makes it a nightmare for some people is the, the complicated logic we have to use to store those code length tables. And that's because deflate was designed in an era where you are trying to compress 500 kilobytes down to 200 kilobytes or something. You're working with such small files that you don't want to use an extra 100 bytes representing a code length table. One could argue that in today's ecosystem, where you might be trying to compress a gigabyte of data down to 500 megabytes, losing a few bytes here and there in exchange for having a scheme that can achieve really good compression elsewhere isn't such a big deal. You wouldn't put too much effort into the code length table encoding. But back in the era of deflate, that was a big deal. Getting rid of any bit anywhere was a big deal for the designer of deflate. But these code length tables are big, and so block type 2 uses an extremely convoluted scheme for them, and I wouldn't blame you for thinking it's stupid when you're done seeing it, but I hope that over time it grows on you and you can see that it is trying to solve a pretty complicated problem problem. And although it's pretty unpleasant to go through all the details, it does manage to solve the problem. So you have to give it credit for that. Um, okay, so suppose we have a code length table. So suppose our LL code length table is this, and um, my distance code length table is this. You'll see that some symbols have a length of zero. In this context, a length of zero means the symbol never appears. So it gets a code length of zero because th that's a way of signaling to the decompressor that this symbol never appears at all. It doesn't actually have an encoding at all. So that's what a code length of zero means. It means you'll never see the symbol. Um, and I also, wherever you see ellipsis, that is where, uh, that's a run of, a long run of zeros. So every symbol between two and 64 is zero. Every symbol between 72 and 255 and 258 and 285 is a zero. And same with six through 26 in the distance code table. Um, so there are a total between the two tables of 316 different code lengths. 
we have to find a way of encoding all of them into the bit stream. Now, maybe we can use some tricks to avoid encoding all these blocks of zeros, but there still could be lots and lots of non-zero code links, and I have to have some way of encoding it. Now, we've seen a few options for doing that. So we've actually talked about specifically transmitted code length tables before. We could sort the links and use delta compression. And the benefit of that is that if we sort the links and use delta compression, so I've got A, C, B, D, and then um, E here. And A has link, A and C both have length two, B and D have length three, and E has length four. The idea here is that then I could just use deltas of you know, plus zero, plus one, plus zero, plus one, and that would allow me some benefit. Um, deflate doesn't do that. Whether or not that's a good idea is one question, but deflate doesn't do that. Um, there would still be some overhead because of course, if I have a sorted set of symbols, I now have to tell the decompressor what order I'm, I'm using for my symbols somehow. There are a variety of clever ways of doing that. BZIP uses a couple of them. So we'll talk about a scheme similar to what I'm suggesting here when we talk about BZIP. Deflate doesn't do this. Um, so we can think about if we know any techniques. Well, um, from first principles, if we were designing this based on what we've seen in this course, I might try what I just discussed using sort of a delta compression approach. I might also try and use some form of RLE. I, I noticed that these long runs of zeros do seem to be a productive use of RLE. I, I could just eliminate them as one long run as opposed to storing a bunch of zeros in a row. Um, but I should also observe that if I am limiting my code length to 15 bits, then there are only going to be 16 things that could ever appear in the table. So 0 through 15. There are only 16 possible values, and some of them are more common than others. Because of the natural structure of prefix codes, I should expect there to be a certain sense of balance between short and long. But in general, if I have a very short length, I probably don't have very many very short lengths. But I will have a large number of sort of medium lengths in general. Or if I have a table like this one where every length is exactly the same, I should see the same symbol over and over again. But that means if some um, length symbols show up more often than others. If there are some links that are more common than others, maybe instead of worrying about deltas or run length encoding, I should think about what their fair value is. So in this example, for, uh, we've got five is a pretty common value. And across the two tables, three is also very, very common. So five and three are both very common. And that means that they're worth less than, I don't know, this 10. So, so length 10 is probably fairly uncommon. And so what I could try if I want to represent this set of lengths in a small number of bits is prefix coding again. I could use a prefix code to reduce, to, to encode each symbol in a number of bits as close as possible to its information content, to fairly value the symbol. If, for example, I were to store every length in exactly four bits, I would probably see a bit of a loss because that wouldn't fairly value some symbols. There are some symbols that, yes, okay, if I have 16 possible lengths and I encode the symbol 10 in four bits, that's fair enough. But if three is such a common symbol, I'm sort of wasting four bits on it. Maybe I could encode it in fewer than four bits and realize some savings if this is something that applies to a lot of different length tables. And if I'm using strictly a prefix code, if I encode zeros as uh, individual symbols, I could get a savings there too. Although using some form of RLE might help for getting rid of all of those zeros. So based on all of those observations, the idea that different links might be more or less common, so prefix coding makes some sense, and that some form of RLE could help because there could be blocks of the same length all in a row, especially zero links, the designers of deflate, and I'm being magnanimous, I'm using the sort of royal we here, but I believe, as far as I can tell, most of the infrastructure of deflate was just one person. So again, Phil Katz, one, one guy. Um, but other people have contributed to aspects of deflate over time, so I'll say designers. Um, they created this, uh, what I'm going to call the CL code. So a special new set of symbols entirely designed to represent these tables of code lengths. So that means we should call this thing the code length code. But that's going to be a problem because then when we talk about its length table, we've got the code length code length table. And that's going to make a mess. And so um, many computer scientists know that whenever things get confusing, just introduce another layer of indirection. So I'm going to do that here. And I'm not going to call it the code length code because that's a recipe for disaster. I'm going to call it the CL code. The CL code is over this set of symbols. 
Um, and so uh, there are the first 16 symbols are just length values. So if I use CL symbol one, that is an entry of the table that is length one. If I use CL symbol 15, it is length 15. The idea behind the CL code is that I take all of these, I, I represent each length table by a set of CL symbols all in a row, and then I encode those CL symbols using a prefix code. That allows me to fairly value each symbol. So if length three is more common, I can give it a shorter encoding. Um, the CL code also includes these three extra symbols. It doesn't just include symbols to literally represent specific lengths. It includes three extra symbols to provide a certain very basic form of RLE. Um, so um, if I use symbol number 16, that is um, saying encode, repeat the previous length some number of times. And how, how many times? Well, I provide a two-bit offset value. Just like with my length codes and my distance codes, I once I use CL symbol 16, I have to provide a two-bit number to the decompressor to tell it how many repetitions. But you'll see that the two-bit number um, is actually added to three. So if I want to uh, repeat something three times, I would encode the value X to be zero. The reason for this is because, I guess, of the idea that if you just want to repeat something once, so if I've got two fives in a row, I shouldn't use symbol 16. I'll just encode two fives. If I have three fives in a row, I'll still just use symbol five for that. I won't use symbol 16. But if I have four fives in a row, then I encode the first five as a actual length, and I use symbol 16 for the remainder. Uh, so, and then I, I, uh, I would say in this case, X equals zero, because I just want to encode three times. So just like the BZIP style RLE, the, the idea here is we don't want to try and encode short runs. L let's save our bandwidth to encode longer runs. So my two bit offset goes a bit further. Uh, and then I've got CL symbols 17 and 18, which are further specialized. They are entirely for the purpose of encoding zeros. Because as we saw in our table, um, runs of, uh, the same character, the same length more than once do happen. So there's a bunch of fives, there's a bunch of threes, but the longest blocks of consecutive lengths are these blocks of zeros. And so I guess it makes some sense that I should in my CL code try and optimize specifically for the case of using RLE on blocks of zeros. So for that purpose, I've got two CL symbols, one for encoding, uh, encoding relatively short runs of zeros. So uh, three or more zeros at a time. And the offset here is three bits long. So between three and 11 zeros, and then symbol 18 is for encoding longer runs of zeros. Um, runs, uh, so we've got a seven bit offset. So that means I can get up to, I, I don't know, 139 zeros in a row. So that's, that's a pretty large number. And the offset here is, so I give a value Z, it's gonna be Z plus 11, because if I wanted to encode only 11 zeros, I could use symbol 17 for that. That's the reason for the strange sort of arbitrary appearance of 11 there. So between uh, the three of these, which are always followed by some offset, I now have a mechanism to encode my length tables, allowing us both with a prefix code, so I can use a prefix code over these symbols, but also allowing a certain amount of RLE, a tasteful amount of RLE that doesn't get in my way too much, but should allow me to get rid of some of those long runs of the same length over and over again. Okay, so then I take my length table, um, and so this is the segment of the length table. This is lengths 0 through 71 in my table from earlier. So we'll just go take a look just to remind ourselves. Um, so here is length 71. Notice how the first two lengths are 3 and the last length is 8. I want to show how that gets encoded using my CL symbols. Okay, so we go back over here. So there are the first two lengths are three. That's symbol zero. This is uh, symbol zero, symbol one. And then there's symbol 71 over on the right. So what I have really is the length three, the length three, then 63 zeros in a row, then the length six, then the length five, then the length five again, four more times, then the length eight. And as far as CL symbols go, I'll encode the two threes just as the CL symbol three twice. I'll then encode my run of 63 zeros. Well, it makes sense for a run that long that I would want to use CL symbol number 18. The offset I encode is going to be the length of the run minus 11. So that means the offset I use is going to be uh, 52 instead of 63. Then I encode length 6 uh, and length 5 as just CL symbols 6 and 5. And then for the four other fives in a row, I can use CL symbol 16. Um, because I want to encode four in a row, I would set X to be 1 because that way, that way x plus three equals four. Okay, so then x is gonna be equal, equal to one, and finally I encode the symbol eight just as the symbol eight. 
Uh, and so uh, obviously you'll notice that the particular distribution of links is going to result in different frequencies of CL symbols. That's why we use a special prefix code just for the CL symbols. So for each block, I compute these length tables. I then turn each length table into a set of CL symbols. And then based on the CL symbols that I see, I generate a prefix code to fairly value the symbols. So in this limited example, I'd probably want to give three a shorter encoding than, I don't know, 16. Uh, here is the encoding of the entire um, LL table. So uh, we've got, this is the stuff we already saw. There is a run of 138 um, uh, zeros in a row. Uh, earlier, I guess I said the maximum was 139 for symbol 18, but I guess it's 138. Um, and then uh, we've got the remainder of that long run of zeros. So if we look back at our table, we have this huge run between 72 and 255. We can't represent a run of longer than 138 using symbol 18. So we, we break off the first 138 and then represent the remainder. The remainder is large enough that we still need symbol 18. So we don't use symbol 17 at all at this point. Um, then I encode the length 10, then the length 3, and then I use symbol 18 again to encode the last 28 entries of the table. Um, and so based on this, it looks like symbol 18 is pretty common. I use symbol 18 quite a bit. I also see length symbol 3 a decent number of times. Um, and so it makes sense that if I use a prefix code, I want to give those symbols a shorter encoding than, let's say, again, symbol 10, which only seems to occur once. Um, I should also add that when it comes time to encode um, our offsets and our CL symbols, we know that, of course, the symbols like this, the actual CL symbols, will be encoded with a prefix code. But then there's the matter of the offsets. So in this, I have where I've got four offsets. These four offsets are numbers. That means that they get encoded into the stream according to rule number one with the least significant bit first. So just like the offsets for lengths and distances earlier. Uh, okay, so this is the entire LL code table from earlier. Um, and um, the same, when I generate a prefix code for my um, CL symbols, I use the same CL code for both the LL and distance code tables. So what that means is that before I go and generate my CL prefix code, I should compute the CL symbol sequence for both the distance table and the LL code table. Uh, and then based on both of them, um, come up with a prefix code for the CL symbols. Okay, so I, supposing that I've done that, um, the frequencies uh, across all, across both the LL and distance tables um, are shown here. So, so three shows up um, a lot. Actually, this should be frequency, not length. Uh, so in the frequency table, uh, the symbol 3 shows up a lot. I also see the symbol 18 a few times. Um, I also see 5 a decent number of times. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't see a lot of the other ones that often. And so I guess it makes sense that I get a pretty uh, short encoding of 3. So 3 gets an encoding of 1 bit. That's a pretty good length. 18 gets 3 bits and 5 gets 2 bits. Whereas, I don't know, 10 gets 5 bits and 8 gets 5 bits. So I generate a prefix code using Huffman coding. Um, and then uh, I have this CL code that I can use to actually encode uh, my, my length table. So here is the LL table from before. So it's just this, but completed to include the prefix coding. So here, remember that 3 got a 1-bit encoding. So there's two examples of the 1-bit encoding for 3. There's my 3-bit encoding for the symbol 18. Here is the offset with the least significant bit first. Um, and then here's more encodings of CL symbols here. And then here's another offset. So um, for CL symbol 16, my offset is in two bits. I have to encode those two bits with the least significant bit first. So when I encode the value 1, notice that it comes out as 1, 0, because it's the least significant bit first. OK, so otherwise, I have this full thing encoded. Um, and then I have my way of I have now fully encoded my LL code length table. So I can use this to compact down my, my 286 element LL code length table into what appears to be a pretty small number of bits. So that's pretty good. And I can do the same thing for the distance table. Um, now, then there's the question, though, about what about that CL code? So um, the CL code itself is a prefix code. And I have to tell the decompressor what prefix code I used for the CL symbols, or else how is it going to be able to decode this? So code lengths for the CL symbols are limited to be 7 bits. There are only eight, uh, 19 CL symbols. So it makes sense that we shouldn't allow as many um, the encoding of each symbol to be as long as the encodings for arbitrary symbols in my data. Remember the original data? At some point, we were trying to, to actually compress data before we started talking about these length tables. So the CL symbols can be, at, can be encoded to at most seven bits a piece, which means if I want to represent the table of code lengths of my CL symbols, I could store
store each um, code length in three bits. And fortunately, there's no more meta compression after this. Okay, so again, there's a typo here. This should say frequencies. Um, and so because CL symbol encodings are at most seven bits in length, what I could do is store my code length table for my CL codes as just a bunch of three bit values. So I could just store the CL code length table in the block header as a bunch of three bit values, which means what? So let's see, if I have 19 possible symbols and each is in three bits, that's 57 bits in total. That's not so bad. Um, so there's, there is a couple of a couple more caveats I'm going to get to in a minute there, but we're not going to need another prefix code to store this length table. We're done with the prefix codes. So in total, we have three prefix codes in play in block type two. The prefix code for the LL symbols, the prefix code for the distance symbols, and the prefix code for the CL symbols. We use the CL symbols to encode the prefix, the code length tables for the LL code and distance code. Okay, so for block type two, and we're not done yet. For block type two, we first convert our input data to literal length and distance symbols, just like in block type one. Then we create the prefix codes for the LL and distance symbols. Then we create the code length table for both of those and convert it to a sequence of CL symbols like we just did. We then make a prefix code for the CL symbols. We use that prefix code to encode the length tables for the LL and distance codes. And then finally, we actually encode the data, the data that we started with, the thing that we're trying to compress. Um, and so the block header contains a couple of other options, which I'll unpack in a minute. I want to show a more concrete example. The block header contains some options to truncate the tables because I'm going to scroll way back. Um, but if we take a look at the LL code table from earlier, you'll see that the, the last maybe, I don't know, 20 or so values, uh, 25 values, they're zeros. And maybe that's going to happen a lot. In a short input, we're probably not going to have very many um, back references of a long length. So the block header contains options to just n cut off the um, LL code table uh, after a certain point. So you can tell it, I only want the first 258 entries of my table. Ignore the rest. And by putting that in the block header, you don't have to encode the remainder of the LL code table at all. Maybe that's helpful, although I would argue the CL symbol alphabet does a pretty good job at compacting that block header anyway, because if you look at what happened to it, in my, if I do encode those extra zeros that are at the end, they, they do get encoded pretty compactly. So maybe it's not a big deal. But in any event, the, the flight specification is already written and it already allows this option. So if you notice that LL symbols 275 to 285 are all length zero, you are allowed to just encode the first 275 symbols, or 276 symbols, I think, in this case, um, instead of bothering to encode the remainder of the table after that with zero symbols in the CL alphabet. Okay, so now we've talked about all that stuff, finally. Uh, maybe you forgot, but we were, we were in the middle of a lecture from a compression course about the deflate scheme where we were talking about block type 2. So the block type 2 header looks like this. There are these familiar things. If you scroll back some number of eons into the video, you might remember is last and b type from a long time ago. They are set as usual. Of course, this is block type 2, so we set b type to equal 2. The rest of the block type header are the following values. First, there are these numbers. Then there's the table, the, the code length table for the CL code. Then there is the encoding of the uh, code length tables for the LL and distance codes. And finally, there is the bitstream of encoded symbols and back references. So what about these numbers? The idea behind these three numbers, hlit, hdist, and hclen, is that they allow you to cut off the, uh, the code tables. So hlit is, the, is basically a, a number you can set to tell the decompressor how much of the code table you are going to send. And it's a 5-bit value, which means that there are only 32 possible values. So hlit will be set to the number of total LL code values present minus 257. So in the earlier example uh, where we saw that, um, well, actually going maybe from two slides ago, suppose we observe that every LL symbol from symbol 275 to symbol 285 has length zero, that means you don't want to bother encoding them for the decompressor. So you will only want to encode the first 275 symbols. There are only 275 symbols that are present. So you'd set hlit to 275 minus 257. And then you'd only include two, the first 275 values of the LL code table in your uh, block header. Um, just to be clear, when I set hlit to zero, so 
deconstructing this formula a bit, when I set h lit to zero, that is basically implying that I'm only going to transmit the first uh, 257 values of the code length table. Um, everything up to and including uh, the encoding for LL symbol 256. Um, and so the idea behind this is that the h lit field allows you to omit the uh, code table entries for symbols 257 through 285 if you don't need them. And if you never generate back references, you'll never need the length symbols, which are symbols 257 to 285, so why not just omit them from the results? So hlit is a way of truncating your code length table. Um, one thing worth considering is why 257? So why do we set this limit of you have to always transmit at least 257 entries of the table, but you can truncate the table afterwards? So a question, I'm just going to go right ahead and answer this. The question um, is, why are we assuming the table always needs 257 entries? And it comes down to the fact that um, LL symbol 256 will always have a code length that's greater than zero, because LL symbol 256 is the end of block marker. And every block must have an end of block marker, which means the end of block marker must get some uh, non-zero prefix code length because it has to actually appear in the block. So it makes sense that we can't cut off our code length table any sooner than then. The, the earliest symbol that will never appear, where no future symbols in the table appear, is symbol 257. Then there is hdist. So hdist is the same idea, but it's for the distance code table. And in this case, you are allowed to omit almost all of the distance code table. Um, so you can set hdist uh, based on, like, you can actually wipe out all of the distance symbols if you want to. And then finally, there's hclen. So hclen is the same concept, but for the CL code table. Because maybe there are 19 things in my CL code length table. Maybe I don't need all of them. So I can set hclen based on this formula, based on how many CL code entries I have, subject to a pretty major caveat coming up on the next couple of slides. Um, I can set hclen so I don't have to transmit the entire code length table, uh, the CL code length table. OK, but then there's this. OK, so here is my CL code length table. I want it to be arranged in such a way that I can chop off all the zeros at the end. But if you look at it, you'll say, wait a minute, there are no zeros at the end. The last entry is symbol 18. That is a 3. So I can't use hclin to truncate the table. What do I do? Um, well, if it were me designing this, at this point I would get a bit lazy and say, don't worry about it. This is, this is too, this is hyper-optimized. I don't need hclin. In fact, actually, the four bits I'm wasting on hclin, I could just use on the CL code length table, so why worry about it? The designer of Deflate had different ideas. Maybe after months and months of working on this scheme with all these bit-level hacks, they were getting maybe cabin fever or something, and um, delirium was setting in. But one reason or another, we're not, the, the torture of block type 2 isn't quite over. So I mentioned that we encode our CL code length table as a bunch of 3-bit lengths, and we do. So each of the 19 values in the code length tables, whichever ones are present, are encoded as 3-bit values. However, they are not encoded in order. The first thing that appears in the bitstream is not the code length for CL symbol 0, and the last thing is not the code length for CL symbol 18. Instead, the CL code length table is conveyed in this completely arbitrary order. First, the length for symbol 16, then symbol 17, then symbol 18, then we get to 0, then 8, and we keep moving along at an apparently arbitrary rate, and then the last two links we encode are, are links, uh, CL symbols 1 and 15. And then before that, 2 and 14. You might see a little bit of a pattern forming starting around, well, actually starting here, but you'll notice 0, 8, 7, 9, 6, 10. Notice the difference between these pairs. Um, we're sort of moving uh, relative to, so 1 and 15, that's, these are the absolute shortest and longest uh, valid lengths, because 0 isn't a real length. And then 2 and 14, so we're sort of moving inward, or we're starting here, I guess we shouldn't pair up 0, but uh, we're pairing up, I don't know, 7 and 8 and, and so on. Um, really, we only care about sort of the pattern forming at the end here. Um, I think... As far as my attempts to reverse engineer why this would be needed, I have a feeling it's because of the fact that, on average, it's pretty unlikely for a non-trivial input that you are going to have any symbols with length 1. 
Because for a symbol to have length 1, either your input is really short and has very few symbols, or your input is longer but has one symbol that absolutely dominates the rest of the other symbols in frequency. That's not very likely. In practice, if I compress practical data, it's pretty unlikely that there's one symbol that's, that appears more than 50% of the time. Similarly, it's pretty unlikely, on average, that you have symbols that have an extremely long length, so length 15, and also length 14 and length 2 are probably relatively uncommon. It's pretty likely to have a lot of lengths in this general area, but pretty unlikely to have length 1 or length 15 or even length 2 or length 14. Because the idea among all 8-bit symbols for one symbol to be occurring more than 50% of the time, which is what you'd need for symbol um, to have length 1, or 25% of the time for symbols to have length 2, that's pretty unlikely. So I think the reason that these are reordered is to make it so that because we think that, you know, length 0 probably doesn't doesn't appear very often. It's unlikely the CL symbol 0 is used at all. Same with CL symbol 15. This weird ordering is meant to make it so that the ones that are at the end are more likely than the other ones to all be 0. So that means you could cut the table off here and only encode up to length 13 in this weird ordering. Now, that's my attempt to justify it, to give the designer of the scheme benefit of the doubt. It does almost seem like this is a certain form of sadism at this point. Or, I mean, it's sadism on the part of the designer. On all of our part, it's masochism. Um, that we're forcing ourselves to use this absolutely bizarre arbitrary ordering. But there it is, and it's hard-coded. We have to use it. So we're stuck with it. The code link table gets encoded that way. I think the la that's the last part where the scheme is sort of twisting the knife. This whole CL code business felt a bit like torture. I think this is the last of it. And we can now, once we know this last piece, we can now go forward and begin trying to use it. Um, so uh, just as an example, if we use that table from earlier, um, if we take, here's the, the code length table we have in the sensible numerical order. If we put it in this weird order, notice how before it doesn't end with a bunch of zeros, but now it does. If I chop it off here, I can just avoid sending these by setting hclend to be 14. That's the idea. I save on a little bit of encoding. Not that much, though. I mean, this is going to be, what, 3 bits times 5, so I save 15 bits at the expense of having this 4-bit value in the header, um, so I'm saving a net of 11 bits, but any bit counts, I guess. Uh, okay, so then after I've got all of my uh, all of my values, hlit, hdis, and hclen, then I encode the CL code length table using that weird ordering from a couple of slides ago. Um, the actual lengths themselves, when I get around to encoding them, remember that the lengths in the CL code length table are encoded as 3-bit values. They are numbers, and that means that rule number 1 applies. Uh, and then I encode, I, once I have encoded the CL code length table, I uh, add my encodings of the LL and distance code length tables, that is using the CL prefix code. So we already saw an example of that earlier. And then finally, after all of this stuff, I encode my actual input symbols. So I begin encoding my actual stream of LZSS symbols, literals, lengths, and distances. And because by then the decompressor has everything it needs to be able to decode that stuff. Okay, that is a lot. That is a lot. And so because I know most people don't will glaze over pretty early through that much of a conceptual discussion, uh, I will propose that perhaps it will help to see a complete concrete example. So I want to walk through with this input, I want to walk through every single one of those steps and I want to show you the bit sequence that comes out and I want to show you something you could run through a gzip decompressor to verify that everything I've been saying for the last two hours and 15 minutes or so uh, isn't complete garbage. So I want to walk through a complete example of this particular input, an input I've chosen to be simple and to be contrived enough that it's clear that I'm that there's nothing up my sleeve, but to contain a couple of non-trivial back references. So if we go through our first few steps, um, we add our end of block marker, then we do LZSS, and we end up creating these two back references, 4, 5, and 9, 10. Now one disadvantage of this, which may or may not be a problem, but one thing that you'll have to use your imagination about is, once I'm done with LZSS, notice that every symbol only occurs once. So when I do prefix coding, if I look at the literals, they're all going to get pretty much the same code length, plus or minus one. Uh, and same with the length symbols. So in a more complicated example, I might want to have, let's say, the literal A appearing more than once. But just this is already complicated enough, so we'll leave it at that. That's one deficiency of this particular input. 
Um, okay, so for a real input of this size, I should add, this is input so short that all of the machinery we need for block type 2 would put us at a loss. It would take way too many bits to encode all those length tables to make block type 2 worth it, especially because the prefix codes we use wouldn't give us much of an advantage on this particular um, set of symbols. Instead, uh, I would expect a gzip encoder and probably your A2 code once you've added all the bells and whistles. I would expect probably that the that the real gzip encoder uses block type 1 for this. Block type 1 would allow LZSS to be used, so yield some compression there. Block type 1 also uses um, the fixed codes used by block type 1 also do allow some amount of compression um, of length symbols, so maybe you'd get something out of prefix coding there, but I would expect certainly that block type 2 wouldn't be used. Block type 0 could be generated but block type 0 would definitely result in expansion. Okay, so first, uh, and so just to be clear about that, what I'm saying is if you actually tried compressing this with gzip, it wouldn't use block type 2 at all. I, I acknowledge that this is a, that I'm tilting at windmills using block type 2 for such a small input here. So first I take that sequence of LZSS symbols and I convert it to a sequence of LL symbols, distance symbols, and offsets as we did much earlier in this lecture. Um, we then use the frequency information of each symbol to compute prefix codes. Now the prefix codes are going to be very boring because I've got a bunch of LL symbols, but all of them occur exactly the same number of times, so once. I have two different distance symbols and each of them only occurs once. So I actually end up with this situation. Um, and I think, yeah, my automation may have, I, 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 clearly there's a typo in my automation for this, but these tables should say frequencies. Um, okay, so the LL symbol, the code length table, well, uh, every um, symbol has frequency one. And in my distance, uh, symbol table, every symbol also has frequency 1. So not too exciting, although frankly, we know how Huffman codes and prefix codes work, so we can use our imagination here. That means when I do generate the code lengths, everything in my LL alphabet gets a code length of either 3 or 4. So Huffman coding is trying to split the difference here. It can't generate everybody a length of 3, but it can try its best to give some code lengths of 3 out due to the sort of rounding behavior of information content. And the distance code table is especially interesting because it's just going to have two two encodings of length 1. So probably 4 is going to be the single bit 0 and 6 is going to be the single bit 1. And indeed, here are our prefix codes. So the LL codes for the symbols that actually get used are these. The, distant co the distance codes are these. So once I have the LL and distance codes, I can actually co construct the complete bit stream for the encoded data. So make a note of this for later. It starts with 1111 and ends with 100. Um, but we can't use this yet. So this is the encoded bit stream for the block data. This is going to come at the end of the block's encoding. We're not ready to use it because before I can add this, I have to encode the, the um, CL code length table and the LL code length table and the distance code length table. So here's where things um, have to accelerate for the block 2 uh, machinery. So to encode the block header, I'm only going to encode the LL code lengths for symbols up to and including symbol 263, because everything after symbol 263 is a zero. So I'll set H lit to be 264 minus 257. So 264 is the number of total LL symbols that appear. And there are 264 of them because I go from 0 to 263. So 264 minus 257 is 7. Okay, so I set that, I set H lit to be 7. Um, for distance codes, well, actually, I only, I only use up to distance code 6. So there's only 7 total distance code lengths that I need to represent in my table. So I will set H dist to be 6. Okay, so that's going to allow me to save some space and some trouble by not even storing, not even encoding the representations for the last little bit of both of those tables. So I take what's left over and I uh, turn, this is the, for the LL table, I will turn that into a sequence of CL symbols, so I get this. So a run of 32 zeros, uh, let's see, so 32 zeros, then the number 4, then another long run of zeros, then 4, then some 3s. Okay, so there's 32 zeros, then there's 4. Then there's some more zeros, then there's a four, then a three, then I've got three more threes using CL symbol 16, then a really long run of uh, zeros, and then three um, CL symbol zero. There's a, a rare example of a zero appearing all by itself, um, and then three again, and then a short run of zeros. There, for the first time in this lecture, I'm using symbol 17, uh, and then CL symbol three. Um, and for the distance code table, it's pretty damn simple. So just a bunch of zeros and then one, zero, and one. Um, one thing I should add that we're not doing in this example, and you might want to do it, but maybe you don't, um, you actually are allowed to encode uh, when you 
emit these CL symbols, you're allowed to encode the LL and distance code tables as one long run of CL symbols. So you could actually have, um, if the, dis the LL table ends with some zeros, you could continue that run of zeros into the distance table. But we're not going to do that. We're allowed to, but not required to. Um, and so then I compute, okay, yep, there it is again. So, uh, so then I, I've got the frequencies of each of my CL symbols, and then I can use that to run Huffman coding and compute the lengths of each of my CL code um, symbols encodings. I can actually generate the prefix code using the standard algorithm. And of course, then I have to take the table of code lengths and rearrange it into the weird ordering. Because of this toy example, I actually do have a symbol. Um, one of my CL code symbols, um, uh, or my LL code symbols, actually has length one. And that means that I use CL code symbol uh, uh, one, and that means that if I use this bizarre length, I don't actually get the intended benefit. The intended benefit is for there to not be any symbols of length one, and so I can just, I can just um, omit this part of the table. But in this case, because it's such a small example, there were symbols in the LL, or actually these were distance code symbols, that actually had length one. So I, I don't actually get the benefit of using HCLAN or the stupid ordering. But in any event, I'm able to chop off the last element of the CL code table. So I set HCLEN to 14, which means I'm only encoding 18 of the 19 symbols. The other one is implied to be zero. All right, so then I can use the CL code that I came up with to encode the tables. So the actual encoding of those tables, um, the LL code table, the encoding begins with 0, 1 and works its way all the way to 0, 0 here. And there's the distance code table, 1, 1, 0 to 1, 0, 0. Um, okay, and I'm actually, I've, I've got everything. I've got all the pieces. I can put them all together. So I begin by the with the block header and the h lit, h dist, and h c len values. That would be these three things. The previous slides have already talked about what I set those to. Um, and the next thing I encode is so I set h c len to be um, uh, seven, which means I'm encoding. Or I set h c len. Sorry, h c len is fourteen. Um, so I'm encoding uh, only eighteen values of my table. I almost said seven. Oh, I did say seven there, but I'm going to backtrack on that. Remember that h c len was a number. So I pushed it into the stream least significant bit first. It's not the number seven. It's actually the number fourteen. It's one 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 zero in base two, which is fourteen. Um, so I I, had to, I almost tripped on that. So what H C Len is saying is I'm only going to encode um, as we see here 18 values of my table. So from C L symbol 16 to C L symbol one in the weird ordering, and there I am. There's C L symbol 16. There's C L symbol one. Okay, the next thing I do is add the encoding for the LL code length table. So it starts with 0, 01, ends with 00. We can see it a few slides ago. There it is, 0, 01 to 00. zero. Um, and the, then I'll do the distance table. So there's 110 to 100. You can scroll back and verify that that's correct. Okay, so I now have the encoding of that. And finally, after all of this stuff, I can encode my actual data. So the actual literals and back references and the end of block marker are showing up at the end of the block. So we can see when, when all is said and done, most of the data that I encoded was the metadata. It was the encodings of the length tables and the encoding of the length table for the CL code. And so that's one reason why if we actually um, wanted to compress this in practice, we wouldn't use block type 2. Um, the real GZIP compressor will use block type 1 for this because if I use block type 1, it doesn't matter why, the issue, why this issue occurs, but in block type 1, I use fewer bits. Instead of 187, I use 100, 187. I use 194 bits, or I use just, just 94 bits instead. So obviously block type 1 is better. And usually uh, compressors that can generate all three block types, and most of you will write compressors that can do so, usually what you would do is um, ingest some data, so get maybe 100K of data, and then look at it and decide which block type to choose based on that. You might even try computing block type 1 and block type 2 and just comparing them. If block type 1 comes out shorter, then use it, because you, obviously that would give you better compression. So of course, because of how small the example is, all of the prefix code infrastructure isn't worth it, and so we end up actually wasting space with block type 2. But the point of the example was to show off the bit sequence. Um, so a good exam question is, here's an input, uh, and just give some in point form, describe reasons you might choose block type 1 versus block type 2 or vice versa. Or alternatively, um, if I tell you, give me an, I could say, here's a block type, like block type 1 or block type 2, give me an example of some inputs where I would, would rather use this block type for those inputs than some other block type. 
Now, it's one thing for me to, you know, talk about zeros and ones for two hours and then say, see, we did it. We've, we've encoded deflate. But we're, we should all be scientists. You should be able to check my work. So just in case you don't believe me, in case you don't know, in case you don't believe that this weird sequence of incantations I've come up with actually is the deflate bitstream, I have posted a .gz file that contains this exact bitstream. And you can verify that when you decompress it, it does decompress, and the original input that I had is what comes out. And it's inside a standard, fully compliant .gz container. Um, when I turn the bitstream into a set of encoded bytes, it's going to look like this, as per the rules from earlier. So I have to first, um, this is 187 bits, which isn't aligned on a byte boundary. So I have to pad it out to be zero aligned, and then I can turn it into bytes, using the rules from earlier, where if I go through my bitstream from left to right, if I accumulate my first byte of data, I think that would be this, the first byte of data would be encoded as 0011, uh, 1101. Um, so, I, uh, so I should expect it to be, you can see this is going to be 0x3d because of that rule that when I push stuff into my bit stream, I push least significant bit first. And sure enough, there's 3d. Um, and so this is the exact sequence of bytes that I should expect to see in my .gz file where the deflate bit stream goes. Uh, and so I had to add some padding, but the padding is going to be at most 7 bits. Uh, and so here's, uh, I, I will post this block2example.gz file. If we go look at the hex dump, then here's, there's 3D, and then it ends in 6D01. So it starts 3DC6, ends 6D01. There's 3DC6, 6D01, sure enough. Before that, the first 10 bytes would be the block header, the gzip header. The last 8 bytes would be the checksum um, and the total size of the data. I run that through my gzip decompressor, and what comes out looks exactly exactly like what I expect. It was my original encoded, my original input piece of data. Now you could look at this and say, yeah, but anybody can doctor a hex dump. Great. Okay. So go and grab that .gz file and try decompressing it yourself. I want you to do that. I also want you to run that through gzstat um, because I, I don't want you to take my word for basically anything in this course. Um, try running it yourself, and then if you're not if you're still not convinced, use gzstat, which could tell you things like this is a block in type two. Here are its prefix codes. Uh, if you need more convincing. Uh, oh, and the, the, even the slides think it's a good idea to take a look at this using gzstat. Um, you might also actually want to see what happens. Suppose you took this piece of data and compressed it with the actual gzip compressor. It would probably generate block type one. Do that and run that through gzstat. That way you can compare what gzstat generates for a block 2 versus block type 1. Uh, you could also run gzstat on the output of the A2 starter code, which generates block type 0, just to get a flavor for what, the out what gzstat can tell you about all three different block types. Um, okay, so where does that leave us? That seems like a lot of information, and in a sense it gives us so many choices that we are probably all very, very overwhelmed. The problem is, when you begin working with such a complicated compression scheme, and all modern schemes are basically this complicated in one way or another, you give the compressor tons of options. And when you're designing these schemes, that's sort of the idea. The designer of a scheme um, might design a compressor that doesn't even use all of the available options. The original deflate uh, compressor didn't necessarily always get the best possible back references or exploit all of the options the scheme gave it. But because the scheme is general and allows these decisions, as time goes by and technology advances, people might want to write compressors that make better decisions or do different optimization because more processing time or memory is available to make those choices. So there are lots of avenues to achieve compression. The question is, what do we do to improve compression? We certainly know that um, doing the, the obvious stuff correctly, using Huffman coding, using back references, that can help. But what about finer grained things? Um, the compressor has so much control that there are lots of trade-offs. And there's also, of course, the other overarching trade-off between speed and compression. Now these days, um, deflate, despite all of the complexity you've just seen, is seen as being a relatively uh, fast scheme to encode. That is, it's, it, un the underlying details, the small window LZSS uses compared to other contemporary schemes, schemes means that you can write a pretty fast compressor relatively easily. So speed isn't as big of a concern, but in general, it's something we should think about because if we design new schemes, speed will be a concern if they're using larger windows or whatever. So there's also the trade-off of speed versus compression. So I want to talk, I want to address that a little bit. 
Um, so here are some compressor decisions that you can make while implementing a compressor that will optimize compression. One of them is how do you split your input up into blocks? If you're using block type zero, you have to split occasionally because the block type zero um, header requires, imposes a maximum length. But block type one and two can be any length. So you could generate a block in type two that's incredibly long, but maybe you don't want to because remember, Inside of a block of type 2, um, a particular prefix code is used for the entire block. If you're encoding a massive file, maybe you want to su switch prefix codes after maybe halfway through or after every few megabytes. So how to make that choice intelligently, how to split your input up into blocks intelligently is actually a pretty non-trivial decision to make because depending on where you make the split, if you have a file, if you're compressing a piece of data with some natural structure, so if half of the file has this kind of structure, I guess, and half of the file has this kind of structure, well then maybe the probability of a particular symbol occurring changes dramatically halfway through. So it makes sense to use one prefix code for this and one prefix code for that. Whereas there are other files that have the same structure all the way through where the extra overhead of generating a second block in type two wouldn't be worth it. But adding some logic to detect that somehow, so for example, stopping every now and then and looking at the data you're encoding and deciding whether it benefits from using the prefix code you already generated, that actually could produce better results for deciding when to give up on the prefix code you're using and make up a new one, or making the decision to use block type one instead of block type two. There are some pieces of data, like short snippets of data, where the overhead of block type two just isn't worth it. There are also some snippets of data, and in fact, the input from earlier is sort of one of them where the custom prefix codes don't really help you very much. I mean, you can conceivably think of cases where the custom prefix code you come up with in block type two ends up happening to exactly match the code that block type one uses anyway, which means you could save some bits by just using block type one. The next thing, of course, is this issue, the feedback loop I alluded to earlier back references versus literals. So in some cases, a back reference, especially one with a very long distance, could end up requiring a huge number of bits just for the offset on the distance symbol. Um, and that's especially true when you're using block type two, because I could end up with literals being, in, in some cases, I might be able to encode certain literals in like three bits because I'm using prefix coding. So there are cases conceivably where a certain sequence of literals, like maybe the sequence ABC or ABA or something, if these happen to be very common literals, the sequence of three literals could be encoded as literals in like six or eight bits. Whereas the back reference just for the offsets could already be running me in you know 10 or 15 15 bits. And then there's this. This is really scary. Um, this is something you probably wouldn't address on assignment two because it's a very high, high order issue, um, which is that uh, there's a sort of this feedback loop between literals and back references. So I already mentioned that there's the obvious case of generating a back reference with length three and distance 30,000 could be costly because by then I'm probably already using 16 bits or something just to represent the back reference. Maybe my symbols, individual literals, can be represented in fewer characters. That's one thing. And that's something you can measure. You can easily compute um, based on the literals you're using. You can compute whether a back reference is more efficient than using literals. But there's this certain feedback loop that's really weird, which is um, suppose a certain back reference shows up over and over again. So let's say 310 keeps showing up among many other back references. So assume that lots of stuff is happening between these, but suppose that over your block, the back reference 310 shows up over and over again. And then one day you want to generate a 410. But think about it. If 310 has been showing up constantly, isn't it pretty likely that the length symbol for three, this would be length symbol 257, isn't it likely that the length symbol for three gets a nice short encoding, a really short encoding? Whereas the length symbol for four could get a really long encoding. We don't know. Um, actually, this isn't the prefix code. Uh, okay, there we go. So the issue is here, even if this makes more sense as a back reference, it might actually be more efficient to instead of encoding this as a back reference of length four, encode it as a back reference of length three and just add the extra literal in on the end. There are certain cases where even if you get a longer back reference at a relatively short distance, because that particular kind of back reference isn't popular, it could have a long encoding. That's the feedback loop because that's really weird. Because if you switch this to be a three instead of a four, three is even more frequent. And so how you choose your back 
back references impacts your prefix code and vice versa. That's the feedback loop. That is a very, that's a higher order optimization problem because there's no, you can't really attack that from one end or the other. You instead either have to do it in multiple rounds, which of course is a bit of a mess, um, or you just have to take your chances. Um, but that's one thing to think about. There's actually something incredibly powerful, a far more powerful phenomenon available to analyze in deflate bit streams than we typically want to. We typically want to go from one end to the other. First you do LZSS, then you generate prefix codes, not vice versa. Because um, you can't generate a prefix code until you have at least some idea of your back references. But there is this feedback loop that in theory, at least in some really weird hypothetical cases, could produce a little bit better compression. So as far as what an optimal deflate bitstream looks like, there are some cases where you'd have to take this into account. Now that said, this is mostly a curiosity. Maybe don't worry about this for assignment two. And then also at the very end, I want to talk about uh, compressor decisions that optimize speed. Now, these days, unlike in the early 90s, our computers are so fast, we probably don't care that much about speed in the way they would. It's worth knowing how to optimize speed for a lot of reasons, one of which, as I said, is that you might design a compression scheme yourself one day that needs, or like on assignment four, where speed is an important factor, so it's good to know the factors. And also in general, as computer scientists, it's good to know how to do things faster. For example, it would help if I could learn how to give lectures a little bit faster than I I've been doing today. Um, so one example of something to optimize if you care about speed is when to search for back references. Those of you that have speed issues on assignment two, I would recommend tackling this first. Um, if you notice that things are too slow, then what you could do is just maybe don't search as far backwards for back references. Don't go all the way back in time. Don't, don't go back 30,000 characters, go back 5,000 characters. If it results in bad compression, then try and optimize it further. But maybe you discover that on average, it's very rare to have a back reference of distance 30,000. And as I said a minute ago, maybe the compression advantage isn't good enough to warrant actually doing anything about it. So you could always, because it's your decision which back references to generate, you could always just not generate certain back references. Just limit your search and save some time that way. You could also um, choose to use block type zero if it appears as if um, it'll take too long to use block type two or you could use block type one. So this is a much more minor concern. Block type two versus one and for speed is much more minor than block type zero versus two and one. But if you uh, are noticing that generating the Huffman codes or whatever is gonna take too long, which isn't that likely because Huffman coding is fast, you could always use block type zero. The fastest possible gzip encoder probably just uses block type zero for everything. And then finally, you could also cut some corners in block type two. I mean, you're still stuck with all the machinery, all that stuff in the header, but you don't necessarily have to produce the optimal possible bitstream. Of course, as I said a minute ago, the, really the optimal bitstream involves that horrible feedback loop, which we don't want to think about. Um, so you could always cut some corners there. You, you could, uh, you probably still would want to use Huffman coding, but just like you could cut corners on LZSS, you could not generate back references, um, not because you can't find them, but because you don't want to have to encode them. You could also pre-compute some of the prefix codes. In block type two, conceivably, you could hard code in a prefix code as long as you encode it into the block header. So for speed, there are a few shortcuts you can take, although really the biggest optimization I can think of is just um, change the way you're searching for back references if you're searching for back references at all. All right, well, that gives us something to chew on. I think I'm still, uh, I'm, I've worked up quite an appetite for that early lunch I was talking about, so I'm going to go do that, and uh, I'll give you the chance to mull everything over so you can start on assignment two. <laughs>